Hey, Jordan. Yeah. And Marty, do you want to give me a uh, give me a green light when we're ready to go? Unless that's already the case. Yeah, Marty, I um, I think we're good now. We're ready to go. We're ready to go. Okay, and if you could put up the slide for public participation. Thank you. All right, good afternoon. And sorry for the delay, folks. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, prior committee meeting ran a little bit late. Uh, thanks for your patience. I'm gonna call Budget Committee of the Whole to order for today, August 5th. Um, we've got a long meeting scheduled from 1.30 to 4.45. We'll take a couple recesses in between the different sections. Uh, of the meeting. I um, want to start by uh, reminding folks, so we have moved to a webinar format for the committee meetings. We've been using this for some of the recent council meetings as well. Um, up on the screen, you see some links about how to register to join the webinar. Uh, and you can do that live during the meeting as well. Um, uh, the, their first one is www.missoulapublicmeetings.com. Uh, there's a, another link after that I won't read. Um, and as is always the case, you can find the agenda and related documents at www.ci.missoula.mt.us slash webcasts. And if you could go to the other slide. <clears throat> Marty or I'm not sure if it's you're controlling it. Could we go to the slide about public comment? Thank you. Um, several ways to provide public comment during the meeting as well as outside of the meeting. Um, if you are uh, participating in the Zoom today, you can raise or lower your hand during the times for public comment. And, um, and I will take those at various points during the meeting. Um, there's a way to do it on uh, iPhone or Android phone. And if you're dialing in um, to the webinar, there's a star nine feature to raise and lower your hand. And we'll see that come up uh, as well. Um, outside of the meeting, we always have our voicemail uh, number 406-552-6012. Uh, and that provides a, a digitized voicemail to all council members. And then there is the city council email that also goes to all council members. Um, we will start out with a uh, roll. And could you read through the roll? Is that Marty or Kirsten? It's uh, Kirsten. Thanks, Kirsten. Um, Anderson. Present. The Sarah. Present. Contos. Here. Harp. Harp. I think she had sent a note that she might be a bit late to be cow. Okay. Hess. Present. Jones. Yes. Merritt. Here. Ramos. Present. Cheryl. Present. Vasika? Present. Von Lossberg? Present. West? Present. Looks like we have everyone but Hart. Thank you. Uh, we have minutes to approve from the July 29th meeting. Are there any changes to those minutes? Seeing none, those will stand approved. Um, so at this point, I'll take public comment per our regular routine uh, on items not on the agenda. Um, and I see someone with their hand up in the attendees. Mr. Mr. Larson, uh, you've got the floor and I'll just remind folks to please keep your comments to three minutes or less. 
Oh, hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry about that. I, you might have been accidentally muted. Well, again, I'd like to stress the importance of returning to in-person meetings. Um, just this meeting in specific, I had thought I'd already registered for it, but I didn't. And that slide you just put up does not include a phone contact number to, to dial in and actually participate in this meeting. Um, I think I was quoted in NBC Montana last, last night or two nights ago, uh, which during after the, the city council meeting, um, but I'll, I'll reiterate it again. There's usually about 10 to even 30 or more people that participate in these in-person meetings. And as it is now, um, like, a, like you could tell me how many people are in line to comment in, in public commentary right now, but I'd be willing to bet it's less than, you know, five. Um, <clears throat> so I think that we have venues to do this appropriately. I think that we can do it safely. Those of us that are on the city council or in the mayor's office or any participating offices or departments, that are at risk for COVID exposure, as we all are, can, can remote in, I'm sure, to one of these bigger venues that we could do this in. Um, I think that it's, it's drastically important to participate um, and have our, our public participate in these discussions. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm appreciative of the, the AV department and <clears throat> you know the people that are assigned right now to do this webinar. I just think that it's very, very complex um, for the older people in the community, as well as the people who are not technically inclined. And it totally uh, gets anyone without an internet connection or a, a dedicated phone line or cell phone out of the discussion. Um, <clears throat> so um, that's, that's my general commentary. I'd also like to comment on the budget, but that is on the agenda. So I'll, I'll wait however long I have to wait to uh to give those comments thank you um i've got a couple more people in the attendees list uh bear with me that's me <laughs> Matt yep. Larson again, Ward 3. You can move on to the next person. Yeah, I understand that, Matt. Thank you. Oh, sorry. It asked me if I wanted to unmute. I assumed you did that on your end. Sorry about that. Same for me. Uh, Chester, uh, I'm not able to see your full last name right now. Um, SDI City Ward 3, I think, the Riverfront District, and more of I had one thing for the budget and one thing for general curiosity since I'm off the record I'd say I'm interested in weapons both replacing them and figuring out how they work that's just say it's a hobby of mine constantly getting activated and that is all okay thank you sir Ms. Hosel, uh, can you hear us okay? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yep, we can. Okay, my name is Andy Hosel. I live in Ward 2. Uh, first, I'd like to thank council members who I know are taking time out of their busy schedules uh, to meet with their constituents about the budget as well as a variety of other issues. Um, I can imagine that a significant increase in public engagement might make your jobs more challenging in a number of ways. But it's also my belief that it will um, make you better and more accountable and that it will ultimate, ultimately make our community better as well. So thank you. In addition, if part of the frustration associated with increased public engagement is that- just a second. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I'll go on. In addition, if part of the frustration associated with increased public engagement is that the public seems ill-informed, I would, encourage you to do everything you can to provide the appropriate information to make it easy, easily accessible and understandable and to make the process as transparent as possible. Uh, I understand we'll be hearing from the police department today and getting a presentation of their proposed uh, fiscal year 2021 budget. Uh, I just, I think it's important to remember that American policing as it currently exists 
um, did not begin in this country until uh, the creation of the first police force in Boston in 1838. Um, by the 1880s, every major city in the United States had a police force. Police forces initially emerged in response to disorder that was defined um, by powerful elites and economic factors, not actually by crime. In the efforts to label social control as crime, uh, they specifically targeted a group of people that were you know, basically called the underclass, which included the poor immigrants and free black people. Uh, this is how policing became focused on, you know, quote unquote, bad actors or individual people rather than on social and economic factors that create problems in our society. Policing is at its core a system designed to manage inequality and maintain the status quo. It is a system intimately tied to capitalism, politics, and racism. The history of the American policing system is littered with anti-immigrant bashing, strike breaking, massive corruption and white supremacy. What we don't fund, we end up policing. So I urge you uh, members of the council and Mr. Mayor to think about whether this kind of system is the kind that you want to invest in or whether you might work to put funding elsewhere so that those community needs don't end up being things that are policed. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we um, will move into regular committee business, uh, continuation of fiscal year 2021 budget. And Lee, correct me if I'm wrong, the first item is business improvement district. That is correct. Thank you. And I think I saw Linda who is presenting for BID. Good afternoon. Um, I am Linda McCarthy with the Downtown Missoula Partnership. Can you hear me okay? We can. Robert Giblin and I are here today to present the Business Improvement District budget. It is a small and simple budget um, and um, it is generally funded by assessments on properties inside the Business Improvement District. Robert is our Director of Administration and Finance He'll give you a brief overview of the BID budget. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Linda mentioned, um, I'll give a brief overview of the budget itself. Um, and I'll give you a brief overview of who the BID is and what the goals and objectives are. Um, initially created in 2005, uh, the BID um, was set forth to uh, replace the downtown urban, urban renewal district number one. Um, after a five-year term, the BID uh, was renewed in 2010 with 70% support of property owners. Over the next 10 years, the BID worked on a number of different programs um, and then was set up for a renewal in 2020 with 73% of property owners supporting the, the renewal of the district. We've renewed for another 10-year period. So on an annual basis, the BID submits a narrative uh, with a uh, simplified budget to city council and the, that narrative outlines uh, the BID's goals and objectives for the, for the coming year. Those goals and objectives are through administration of the Business Improvement District. Um, they are through marketing of our downtown and the district itself. It is through streetscapes and maintenance or cleanliness of our downtown. It is through safety and policing of our downtown. And then it is through various community development efforts that exist in our downtown, such as work on the downtown master plan. It is through business development and it is through development of our, uh, relationships with our rate payers. The budget itself is structured uh, so that we have uh, administration, safety, maintenance and streetscape programs, marketing, master plan implementation, and of course, develop business development. Uh, the, the business improvement district's total budget uh, expenditures equal uh, the amount of uh, assessment revenues that, that come in on an annual basis through payment uh, by rate payers in the district. Uh, the BID's budget total budget this year, physical year 2021, totals $554,457. That is an increase over last year of $466,759. 
That increase is largely attributed to um, the increase in uh, property tax assessments by the additional properties within the district itself. Each of the programs themselves have, a, uh, have specific components and goals. Um, those goals are largely uh, to meet uh, the focuses of the BID in which we serve the property owners by improving property values and improving the effectiveness and the efficiency of maintenance, safety, and development of the downtown core. That's how the budget is structured on an annual basis from the BID. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, you may have on how we structure the budget itself, uh, what the goals and objectives are, or any other comments or thoughts you might have. So that's an overview of the general budget. And then um, we are uh, wanting to focus specifically on a request from the Flushing District. The Flushing District is a, a downtown district that uh, focuses on garbage removal and uh, street cleaning. Um, the BID has a contract with the city of Missoula to um, clear the cans at, out that are on the streets. We have about 120 street garbage and recycling bins, cans on the street that we empty seven days a week. Um, we have a request in for an increase of approximately uh, $21,000 to help cover the additional costs that we are incurring, that contract is renewed every three years and we are up for a renewal. That's correct. The original program for maintenance was instituted in 2009. Um, it renewed annually for eight one-year terms in which the BID was uh, reimbursed by the city for maintenance of the city's 24 garbage cans. Since 2009, the BID has increased the number of cans from those 24 up to a total of, and I just want to correct Linda, there's a, currently a total of 101 cans between uh, garbage and, and recycling downtown. Once that original contract expired, we did have a three-year contract uh, for each of the last three years to cover the common area of garbage maintenance and recycling. Um, and that contract called for a flat rate fee of $61,000 paid to the BID to cover those costs. Because the BID over the last three years has uh, increased uh, the number of cans downtown to that current total of 101, our costs have increased. Physical year 1920 total cost was $77,806.48. Our projection for costs in the coming fiscal year are $82,327. Now last week um, we uh, discussed the baseline figure of $61,000 to the BID from the city, from the Flushing District, to cover that $61,000. Uh, we are requesting the increase from $61,000 of $21,347 for a total value or total cost of the maintenance program in our downtown of $82,347. To provide a little overview, we did uh, speak with Republic Services a couple of years ago and asked for an estimate for what it would cost for them to maintain those cans um, instead of the, the district or the city. And their estimate was for $156,000 on an annual basis. The BID is requesting the additional funding to cover the BID's costs for the next fiscal year and to maintain the garbage and maintenance program uh, in our downtown. Thank you. Um, quick question and then I see uh, a couple questions. Um, so I'm tracking on the fiscal year 2021 website for the city for the, the preliminary budget. And I'm seeing the, the BID baseline adjustment and the street maintenance, the Flushing District request. I'm not sure that, it, that they correlated number wise with what you just described. Um, the, uh, the baseline increase on the flushing reads it's five thousand twenty four dollars. Did I maybe I misheard or just in not tracking it correctly? Does that match up with your understanding of the increase the the request? I don't think so. No. no. Um, so rather than try to solve this now, let's take a look. Um, oh, Lee, do you want to speak to us? 
Thank you. Um, that is a portion that gets transferred to public works. This is sort of split into two. Um, and, and so there's two requests on the website. There's the one that's labeled as BID and then the, the other street maintenance one is for public works. Okay. So it's the, it's the com combined of the two. Okay. So I, think we probably could use some clarification on in the description areas of those requests to just make that um, a little clearer. Sorry for not tracking that myself. Um, I'm going to go to Gwen. Um, I just wanted to clarify. So my understanding is that there's basically a static flat rate contract and it's been the same for the last three years. So there's an increase now because there's more that needs to be done. There's an increase in capacity. Is there also um, a labor component in terms of labor going up? And then also, and I'll let you speak in a second, sorry. <laughs> it's a big question. Um, and then also um, we're doing more recycling downtown now, which over the last five years in council, we've had a lot of people come in and give public comment over the years about wanting more recycling downtown. Are those kind of the three components that are are the reasons why for the uh, readjustment basically that is correct uh it is the increase in number of cans which requires an increase of amount of labor involved um it is to maintain the seven day week service the bid provides on removal of garbage and recycling and of course it is the additional recycling component um uh, as the the three um reasons for the additional request Great. Um, and I will, I know that we've got a heavy afternoon. I'm just going to put the motion. I'll make the motion, recommended motion, if that's all right with the chair. And I understand there'll be more clarification for the August 10th hearing. Yeah, I appreciate that when I was going to ask for that. So that, um, that motion for these particular components is an order. Um, one comment from myself, uh, there's a lot of important context, Linda and Robert, that you guys provided. Um, and I, I think it would be good for us to get up either a link amidst the budget documents to where they can, where folks can read more, and maybe it's just a link to uh, the BID website, um, or if there is um, a summary presentation of the work that you described, um, we could post it on the, uh, in the city budget portal. So I, I don't have a preference between the two. I just think it's helpful for the public to understand um, and, and have some documentation that uh, describes what you verbally spoke to. Great, so, we'll send the supporting documents off to Lee and Marty. Great, thank you. Um, are there any further questions from council on the motion? Not seeing any, is there any public comment? I'm not seeing any there. So we'll go ahead and take a quick roll call vote. Oh, I'm sorry, I do see there is one person public comment. Chester, go ahead. And I saw about this, but somebody brought up recycling. And I have no idea what my question is going to be. But something along the lines of when you walk downtown Long Higgins anyway, you can see that there isn't a separate space. I'm wondering could we make it a little sign that says what goes well or because I can take some paper and burn it if it was a regular year steam engine and as for plastic bottles recycle them and you know where I'm going from there and if not So all of the recycling containers that we have on the streets do have signage on top. Um, like all recycling in Montana, we have issues with glass and plastic, um, but we do have those cans uh, signed and we do, we do help with uh, sorting and removing. Thanks, Linda. Um, we will go ahead and take a roll call vote on the motion. Uh, Anderson. Yes. Vistera. Yes. Contos. Yes. Hess. Yes. Jones. Yes. 
Mary? Yes. Ramos? Yes. Farrell? Yes. Vesica? Yes. Von Lossberg? Yes. yes. And West? Yes. We have 11 yeses and one absent. Thanks. That'll go on the consent agenda. Um, thank uh, you very much, Linda. Point, point oh, of order. Sure. Sorry. Yes. Brian, I'm here and uh, I was having some audio difficulties. I wasn't sure if my name was called. I know I was uh, late yeah, we, coming in. Thank you, Heather. Um, we did not get you at the beginning, so we'll note you now. Uh, did you hear enough? Did you want to vote on that item? I did, and I vote yes. You got I that, Kirsten? Yeah, I will go ahead and update attendance and update the vote after the meeting. And to clarify, the motion was to direct city clerk staff to draft a resolution for the public hearing on Monday. Yep, that's okay. correct. Yep. For the street maintenance district one and the business improvement districts request. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Linda and Robert. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to... Um, the attorney's office budget. And I'm hoping to wrap this up prior to 2.30. Um, Mr. Nugent. Yes, I'm here and Colleen Roseboom, our office manager should be somewhere on here too. Yes, she is. Good. Do you want me to go ahead and start or you have no, something you wanna say? No, nope, the floor is yours. Okay, I don't think we're going to take 25 minutes till 2.30. I sure hope not. But our office budget, and thank the council for uh, funding us in the past, we basically are continuing <clears throat> the same uh, staffing as last fiscal year, <clears throat> except for the fact that we have three new items, and one of those new items is going to be a uh, second victim witness uh, coordinator position, which we've been successful in getting mostly funded, 80% funded from the Montana Board of Crime Control. It's a two-year grant, and uh, Colleen can explain uh, some of the details to that. She's the one that put together the grant application that was successful. Uh, the second uh, position is needed because there are two courts, and also because the, the volume for the current uh, coordinator, the victim coordinator is uh, overwhelming her to some extent. Then we also, under the capital improvement program, we've got a significant request in there about the case management database for prosecution services, because the company that we have been aligned with or purchased from for the past 15 years gave us notice uh, this winter that they no longer will have that service available in the format that we've been using. So uh, Colleen's been doing a lot of work, working with other Montana local governments to see and compare what other alternatives may exist. It's really important to have this uh, case management data so that we can have uh, electronic uh, proceedings in the courtroom, as well as for maintaining our case files for the prosecutors. And the third item is just what is normally in the budget for uh, the relationship violence services. Uh, the city has chosen to fund that through our office and they have a request for salary and fringe increases, inflationary salary and fringe increases. That's about $4,800. Uh, Colleen can offer a lot of detail, especially on the capital improvement program part of it. So I'm going to ask Colleen to uh, explain both the crime, the second victim witness, as well as uh, the need for the prosecution services uh, database. So Colleen, can you pick it up? Yes. I apologize, I was gonna pull up our documents, but I'm having trouble doing that. So I'll start with our victim witness coordinator. Um, we applied for a two year grant uh, to have a second person in our office um, through the Montana Board of Crime Control. And these are VOCA funds, victims of crime. 
of the Crime Act. Um, basically, we were awarded the grant. We'll know for sure in September. They're waiting for the feds to dole out the money. However, there's a 20% match. So basically what we're asking for in our budget this year is a one-time $16,834 in tax funds to go ahead and um, fund this program. Our victim witness coordinators work uh, in the areas of sexual assault, partner family member assault, uh, orders of protection, those type of crimes. Um, they work very closely with our prosecutors. Um, and right now, I think we've explained to you in the past, we have two full-time courtrooms running and six prosecutors, three assigned to each. And so our victim witness coordinator we currently have is trying to manage jury trials, which we're averaging approximately 128 settings a month. She's going back and forth between both courtrooms. So she's basically working with victims every week um, trying to prepare for trial, that type of thing, assist the prosecutors. And so this second person will assist in all of those duties and we'll assign one to each courtroom and one to three prosecutors on each side. So it'll make us much more efficient, be able to reach out to our victims um, on, on a better basis, on a quicker. And then also they have the regular duties as well, besides just the jury trials, there's bench trials, there's casework and that type of thing. So that is the purpose of our victim witness coordinator position. Um, as far as our CIP request, and there's a, just a couple of adjustments to the baseline that are associated with the CIP request. We learned in February that our uh, database JustWare, which is through uh, Journal Technologies, was going to sunset as of June 30th, 2021. Currently, um, we've been live with this program since 2005, and we hold over one, uh, 100,000 cases at this time within it. So we're kind of on a time crunch. Obviously, we've got to replace this program. The company, um, there's multiple reasons. They do have another program, but not to go with them. Um, it would be far more expensive than what we're looking at. We found the state of Montana is looking, um, the larger counties and cities are all looking at the same program at this time, which will have some great benefits for us in that anyone from the state of Montana that purchases this particular program will be able to see the other jurisdictions and what cases they might have for a defendant, say in Yellowstone County, um, who has actually signed a contract with them already. Um, that's currently something we don't have. That, uh, we should be able to interface with our records management system with the police department, uh, the full court system that the Supreme Court requires, as well as a program that um, calendars our police uh, schedules so that we can coordinate um, trials with officer schedules to the best of our abilities. Um, we, as I said, we are on a time crunch. We need to get this going through. We are a completely paperless office in our prosecution services. And so we run on this. Um, and the diff there is a difference in the pricing, although it would still be more expensive to stick with our current vendor in that these this program will be um, hosted in the cloud. Currently, we maintain that storage here in, um, in our servers. However, this will be cloud-based. Um, there's a lot of great features that will really improve different things that we do, including a victim portal, um, the ability to do grant reporting, automatically through uh, through this program. Um, we're signing up uh, an extra license so that the crime victim advocate we work with daily can come on to it. So um, it's definitely a required need in order to keep functioning and to convert our data over to a, this new program. Thanks, Colleen, appreciate it. Um, and I'll just use this as an example for guiding folks through. You did a great job describing it. And I'm going back to the um, victim witness coordinator uh, additional position. And if folks follow, for instance, the request documentation on the preliminary budget site, and they pull that up, you would see the details of what, comprom what uh, um, add up to the, uh, the position and then 
in the revenue description, you see the portions associated with the grant funding. And then as Colleen mentioned, the 16,834 uh, associated with the tax funded portion of that. I believe that you said that was the match portion um, required to go along with the grant funding. Did I get that accurately, Colleen? Yes, you did. Thanks. Uh, um, great. Are there any questions uh, from council members about the city attorney's office requests? And is there any public comment? Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Jim and Colleen. Appreciate it. Um, Thank you. Give me a moment here to navigate before we get into the police section. Um, I wanted to ask Dale. So Dale, if I could, oh, Julie, go ahead. Sorry, can, um, since we did not get a break before this meeting started, could we take one before we can enter into the police? Yeah, I would, yes, we can. Um, and I will ask Dale to speak to his question that I haven't posed yet <laughs> when we do that. So um, it's 2.14 now, let me check our schedule. I believe we talked about 10 minute recesses. So we're going to recess until uh, 2.25, which should keep us on schedule. Does that work, Julie and anyone else, or does it not work for anyone? Okay, so we will recess until 2.25.
You're pretty backlit, Dale. <laughs> I see that. I need to also disguise my voice, apparently. <laughs> That's a lot better. Hey, Brian, there's a comment on there asking if there's a special time for public comment. Can you address that, please? Yeah, as soon as we're back in order, I will. Great, thanks. So I'm showing 225. Um, I'd like to get us back in order. I'm going to scroll through, make sure that folks are back. Jesse, if you could get your video back on. Sandra, you're there. Thank you. Stacy, Mirta, thank you. Heidi, if you can hear me. I'm going to bring us back in order. Okay, I think most folks are back and it's 225 and I want to stay on schedule. Um, and Marty, are you uh, good? Or Pearson? This is Marty, I'm ready. Okay, ready. thanks. Great, thank you. So we'll be back in order. Um, I appreciate Sandra uh, bringing up the question about public comment. Um, there, uh, we've, we've had public comment at the beginning and I'm gonna take public comment after the presentation, but I also wanna be sensitive to if folks have uh, time constraints or can't attend through the entire presentation. So I'm gonna open it up uh, for a few minutes here for public comment if there's anyone who uh, for some reason can't stay through the presentation and would like to give public comment now. I'm happy to take that and I'll wait a few moments here. Okay, I see a couple folks. Uh, Daniel, can you hear us? Oh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thanks, yeah. So I guess um, the only thing I wanted to bring up was just uh, all these protests downtown is um, our BIPOC community trying to show how we can fight against racism. And um, they're protesting against uh, the mayor's budget uh, specifically. Um, it's not like some abstract concept that they're talking about, these protesters and people standing up for this in town. <clears throat> it's literally this budget that's going on right now. They're trying to talk to the mayor. They're trying to protest uh, your budget. They're trying to talk to the council make sure that you don't allow this budget. But uh, there's just no public uh, serving going on, it seems. After 50 plus days of protests on this, we had the worst police budget and, uh, and uh, less investments in housing and things like that than we had before. So I'm just curious if we're trying to serve the public here and like listen to what's going on or if like the mayor just had his own agenda this entire time. And I just, I just want you to know that they're protesting literally your budget, uh, Mayor Ingen. It's, it's not some abstract uh, systematic racism. It's literally what's going on, the same system that you're trying to uphold and make worse right now. So you either care about um, BIPOC safety in Missoula or you don't, and you're showing that you don't with your budget. So put your uh, money where your mouth is, I guess. But at the end of the day, it just seems like 
you're just going to keep upholding the same white supremacist society since you benefit from it, rather than listening to the people that you're meant to serve. And if you're trying to uh, dismantle racism in any way, now is your chance with this budget and you're just missing the shot. So are you going to listen to the community or are you going to do whatever you want to do, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council? So I just, you know, change the police budget, um, invest in a community safety program that works and listen to BIPOC leadership in town instead of keep ignoring it. And um, then we'll head in the right direction. But, you know, this is just horrible to watch play out. Um, people are scared in our community and you're making it worse with your budget, Mayor Ingen. So I'm just here to encourage you to listen and be a public servant, not do whatever you're gonna do originally. And um, listen to the protesters, listen to uh, Montana Racial Equity Project, listen to other BIPOC leadership in Missoula. And I bet we would start making progress on systematic racism, but you're not, you're doing the exact opposite. So I'm just here to say, change the budget. Um, I hope city council does not approve this budget as is and Hopefully we can move forward to tackle some of these issues. But right now we're taking three steps backwards with this budget. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Carlino. Um, Mr. Larson. Yes, I'd like to uh, speak to the other components of the budget that I don't know that are, if there's a presentation after the police budget, um, but and, and I, I definitely have commentary on the police budget, but just the budget as a whole has um, a lot of questionable material, at least in the new requests. I've only gone over the new requests, um, but I can just give you a few <clears throat> that stand out to me. Um, so, and I've, I've emailed these to uh, my representative, Ward 3, um, Gwen Jones, and I've yet to hear a response from her. I also emailed them to uh, Jesse Ramos and uh, did get a response very promptly from him. I thank all the city council for their service in this, but um, I'd like to make the other commenters and public aware that uh, problems with the Missoula city budget are not new. Um, some of these things have happened at least since 2007, 2008, Certain times, uh, budget, there, there's been certain years where the budget hasn't even been submitted to the state from Missoula um, for an entire year. So, um, and, and there's been gaping holes in it for a long, long time. But here are the current ones that I see and would like explanations from, from city council and from the appropriate departments. And I'll be seeking out those explanations from the department heads uh, specifically if I do not get answers here. Um, yeah, first, uh, these are all superfluous, like extra budget stuff that we don't really need in my mind. The first one that comes to mind is the electronic truck that the parks department wants to buy for $70,000. Um, if you haven't seen, the parks department has quite a lot of trucks and they're quite nice. Um, the other one is the cemetery, which has eight full-time employees as far as I've learned. Um, it, it's requesting a $70,000 one ton dump truck with a plow. Um, and I'm wondering if we don't already have this and how we've been burying people up into this day. Um, and couldn't we just buy an aftermarket plow instead and put that onto our current dump truck if we do have one. Um, I'm also questioning what the mayor's budget line item in the new request sheet is for legislative 2021. And this I think addresses like multiple line items in the new request and probably in the budget as a whole. There's no explanation of this line item. No one knows what this is, but as far as Jesse Ramos could explain to me, he believes that it is a lobbyist that will be hired for the, the legislative term in the state of Montana in Helena for 2021. And I, so I just wanna know how much that normally costs and how many times we've done this before and how much we've spent in the past. Um, the, why does the mayor need $50,000 for communications and survey studies? What are those? Um, <clears throat> and what is the HR department's safety and security line item that can, what does that consist of? And why does that cost $214,000? The last one uh, is the information and technology department. They're getting a $120,000 HDESC technician. Um, I, I do some IT work, so I extrapolated so um, that an HDESC technician. You've had, you've had two chances. This is my last item. This is my last, last item. Um, 
there's a $120,000 allotment for the salary of a help desk technician. If you Google the national averages for help desk technicians, they, they top out in the area um, in Washington state at $62,180, literally almost half of what is allotted in our budget. Um, okay. Yeah, Thanks. That's and I'll keep you, digging and keep sending questions to you if possible. Items. So that'll be it. Um, Courtney, let me, Courtney, can you hear us okay? I can, thank you. Yep. Yeah, my name is Courtney Von Linder, and um, I believe I'm in Ward 1, Lower Rattlesnake. Um, just want to take an opportunity to thank you all for your work and your service. I know your jobs are not easy. I can't imagine doing it. Um, so thank you for investing your time and your energy into our community. Um, and speaking of our community in this time of pandemic, I just want to remind you all that we have a lot of folks in our community who are experiencing um, a lot of insecurity surrounding um, financial stability as people lose jobs, um, are being laid off and just struggling to keep themselves afloat um, during this time of uh, a pandemic essentially. And with that comes um, losing homes and losing houses and um, further stability in their lives. And so as our city council and as we take a look at this budget and what we are investing in, um, I just wanna continue to invite you all to continue investing in our communities um, and investing in housing specifically in Missoula um, because we are just like housing budgets and things like that are not being fulfilled or sustained. Um, the housing market in Missoula is totally absurd. If you looked at the numbers recently, um, I don't have them off the top of my head. And I know if we're another constituent spoke to this earlier, um, but as we look at, you know, as people continue to lose homes and things like that, they'll be experiencing increased houselessness and whatever we're not funding in our budgets um, is what we will end up leasing in the end. And so as we have these conversations and as you move forward in um, looking at the budget and things like that, I just want you to remind, want to remind you all of what we are experiencing right now in this time of pandemic and what it means to invest um, in our community and provide stability and access to housing in uh, Missoula, which is something that I think you all have tried to make a priority and I hope that that just remains one. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Van Lindern. I'm gonna take two more. Um, Chester, go ahead. And if you'd look at the comparison between housing and police proposed budget, then it's going to be 2,929, well, dollars $2, in favor of police. Even if you would divide that in half, that'd still be more than the police should need. And if you go with the amount of, well, there's no specific details, just saying special troop transport for the unknown vehicle that the police department is going to get. It could be a PC, it could be anything else. I don't really know. Neither does it really say. And that's going to be all. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna um, get to the police presentation. Um, I wanna ask uh, the Chief Administrative Officer, Dale Bickel, um, if Dale could just speak Process-wise, um, I meant to kind of review this at the beginning of the meeting, but it's worth going over again. Uh, so Dale, if you could confirm and then sort of walk the public through. Um, we received Department of Revenue numbers last week and how that interfaces with the administration's um, uh, funding of what it's identified as priorities. Sure. Um, uh, by Montana statute, we get our uh, property tax values in by the first Monday in August, and that is indeed the date we receive them. Um, the numbers uh, were very close to what we budgeted. Um, we are uh, it was slightly below what we expected, but um, uh, but we think we can proceed uh, with this current budget without a lot of adjustments. Our the process um, is going to continue. We're going to continue our normal committee budget meetings. Um, over the next the course of um, the coming weeks. So the major department that um, has not been heard yet is development services and that departmental budget meeting is uh, next Wednesday. Also on this coming Monday night is the opening of the formal uh, public hearings on the budget at 
council. Um, as part of that presentation, um, the mayor will deliver uh, his uh, uh, budget um, based on the on the funding needs uh, um, that we've allocated uh, based on the property tax numbers we've received. So that'll be the time when we will roll out um, which new requests are being proposed to be funded. Thank you, Dale. Appreciate it. And I believe actually the mayor, you were going to be up next as we get into the police budget and then the chief. Thank you, Mr. Ron Losberg. Thank you, council members. Good afternoon. Uh, Chief White and I are in the same room and we'll be presenting uh, these new requests to you in a tag team fashion. But first, I have an introduction that I hope sets the stage uh, and uh, offers some insight into our approach to the police budget and our philosophy. Uh, in the maelstrom of a global pandemic and a nation reckoning with a legacy of racism, injustice, and violence against black and brown people, police departments and the elected officials accountable to and for those apartments, uh, departments are facing unprecedented scrutiny. To my way of thinking, that is a good thing. Over the course of the last 14 and a half years serving as Missoula's mayor, I bucked against the status quo, believing that our local government can improve and better serve the community through intentional incremental change. Whether reforming zoning code, acquiring a water system in the public interest, uh, expanding and upgrading our park system, filling more potholes, upgrading a wastewater plant, committing ourselves to ending homelessness, or building new fire stations, we've made a lot of change in the interest of making Missoula the best place it can be for all of its residents. That work is never done and I am not done doing that work. And I don't believe the status quo in our police department is satisfactory any more than it is in any other department, including the mayor's office. We learn, we grow, we adjust to evolving community values and priorities. In 2015, when the United States Department of Justice told me that our police department, along with the University of Montana and other partner agencies engaged in a pattern and practice of discriminating against women in cases of sexual assault, we went through a painful process of acknowledging our <clears throat> weaknesses and correcting our policies and procedures to ensure we were working with victims to ensure justice. Today, we are a model department in investigating sexual assault, and we employ techniques and processes that combine compassion and trust in victims, independent reviews of our work and collaboration with others in the legal system to hold perpetrators accountable. That is police reform writ large. It was painful, required self-reflection, accountability, accountability, a willingness to change and investment. We're better at taking care of our community because of our investment in training policy and infrastructure. And amid calls for police reform today, I continue to believe that investment in training, policy development and infrastructure is necessary to improve and that improvement must be intentional. I don't think the Missoula Police Department was broken before George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis, nor do I think the department is broken today. What's changed is that folks are paying more attention, rightly so, and want to know that I and the Missoula Police Department are keenly aware, aware that our community has high standards for public safety and for police officers, and won't tolerate the moral failures and criminal acts that may have become common in some departments around the country, and they want us to continue to improve. We are keenly aware, and we know that we can improve. You'll see some statistics today about our use of force. Both Chief White and I want to understand what those statistics represent, whether our policies, procedures, and training are appropriate to the challenges of ensuring public safety for everyone. Every time we use force to maintain public safety, we need to be sure that that force was necessary and matched the level of threat to public safety. And while we document and review each of those cases, we believe that process can and should be more transparent to those we serve, which is why Chief White is proposing a resident advisory council outside of the police commission to the chief, uh, that advisory council would uh, advise the chief and me 
on public safety. In addition, Chief White will produce an annual report to the community. And as always, our doors are open to hear complaints and concerns and assist residents with formal or informal processes to avoid uh, to address those complaints and concerns. In the meantime, I think we know this, a better educated police officer is a more effective police officer. Chief White brings considerable experience to bear in leading the Missoula Police Department. And in his review of our department, he immediately recognized that our training across the board was inadequate. You'll see that addressed in this budget with continuing education and advanced training for all officers. You'll also note an emphasis on bias and de-escalation, two of the critical concerns I continue to hear from the community. In addition, you'll note that we're expanding our training in crisis intervention because until there is a federal or state solution to helping folks in crisis, even with our mobile crisis team, Missoula police officers will continue to serve in that vital role meeting people in crisis where they are, stabilizing the situation, and connecting those in crisis with appropriate services. As we continue to invest in alternative responses, there may come a day when an officer isn't the first responder in a behavioral health crisis, but that's not going to happen overnight. So I want officers who are well-trained to help people in crisis 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. We also know that community policing works through our long partnership with the Missoula Downtown Business Improvement District and our dedicated downtown police officer who has built relationships with residents, businesses, and property owners that are meaningful, compassionate, and productive. That officer working in partnership with social work students is solving problems daily, helping folks find resources, making vulnerable individuals uh, feel safer and preventing crime by being visible and available. Because we applied for and received a federal grant to hire an additional downtown officer, we'll be expanding that community policing model in the area. And Chief White will tell you more about our policing, our community policing goals in his presentation. That federal grant also allows us to hire an officer to review digital evidence, of which there is more than ever to help solve crimes and meet community expectations. Chief White and I agree that we have an obligation as leaders and uh, that the community shares an obligation to keep our public safety personnel as safe as possible in a dangerous calling. For that end, we're asking for helmets that officers can wear when facing armed individuals in the same way we provide those helmets to firefighters when they expose themselves to danger as part of their jobs. Today with ballistic vests, we're protecting uh, officers' hearts but leaving their brains vulnerable. And part of keeping officers safe remain, means providing them with a safe place to store their gear, to shower and change clothes. As you'll see, those showers and lockers are nothing fancy, but will go a long way in making our workplace more humane and safe for officers and their families. And in light of COVID-19, I think this just makes sense. We have some old rolling stock, and again, in any other year, no one would give a SWAT van or utility trailer a second look. You'll see in Chief White's presentation what we're looking to replace and what we're planning to purchase. And it's not an armored vehicle, as some internet rumors would suggest. We're also replacing some vehicles that have simply outlived their usefulness. In the end, I'm proposing on behalf of the department and Chief White funding these investments in a police department that isn't broken but is not perfect, that works hard but could work better, in officers who are eager to learn more and do better work and help more people. We will be more accountable because of these investments. This investment is not mutually exclusive of meeting the needs of vulnerable souls in our community, nor does it detract from our intentional efforts to support the basic human needs, chief among them housing. This council has approved nearly $10 million over the last few weeks to support affordable housing in Missoula, along with ongoing investments in ending homelessness, providing emergency shelter, supporting food programs, and more. In 2018, I created a department dedicated to helping the most vulnerable in our community, and that department continues to expand its mission as the federal and state governments continue to abdicate responsibility. Local government is left to do work that it's never done before. 
but we're adapting and we're facing that responsibility with some dismay and plenty of resolve. If we didn't invest in the way that we're proposing, we will continue to do the work that's expected, but not at the level that I believe this community deserves, desires, and in some cases demands. And if we were to go further and cut the police budget, calls would go unanswered, folks in crisis would go unattended, and we'd prevent, investigate, and solve fewer crimes. Most of our budget is invested in human beings the women and men who work to do the daily work of public safety and cutting the budget simply means eliminating positions and that has consequences to the community that I find unacceptable. Chief White and I believe that the Missoula Police Department can be a model for other communities hoping to maintain a safe, equitable home for their residents and visitors and that we're just beginning the process of making a good department great. We want to take advantage of community interest in doing all of what we do better and believe that these requests are thoughtful, intentional, and will yield results that improve the lives of those we swore to serve. We have a PowerPoint presentation for you and I'm going to share the screen and Chief White will take it from here. Can everyone hear? Uh, I don't think it's, it's, I'm not seeing it on my screen. I don't think others are. Sorry. There, oh. that, that's working. Thank you. Okay. Are, are we are we off and running? Yep. All right. Thank you, Council and and Mayor. Um, before we get into the the formal part of the presentation, I'd just like to say that providing public safety to our community is a large, multifaceted, and complex duty that all the dedicated men and women of the police department have sworn to provide. Our personnel are called upon to handle a wide variety of calls for service. Those calls for assistance from our public requires our officers to respond to events that are sometimes tense and uncertain. In doing so, our officers place themselves in possible line of harm in order to peacefully resolve the event, protect innocent victims, and help our community. Our officers carry out their duties under all of these conditions with the highest level of professionalism, and compassion. The ability of the police department to continue this level of service and find areas of opportunity for improvement and growth takes resources and investment. I was asked to find these areas of opportunity. The areas of opportunity for improvement are reflected in the budget proposals we will discuss today. The proposals continue to move the department forward in our duty to provide professional public safety, community engagement, transparency, and officer safety. So the first thing I wanna talk about is some of the accomplishments of the police department in the last year. The first one is our Project Safe Neighborhoods, which is a collaborative effort with our law enforcement partners and the U.S. Attorney's Office. Based on the rele public release from the U.S. Attorney's Office, based on the efforts of this grant and this program, Missoula has a low violent crime rating and it's the lowest it's been in three to five years. So we are making great improvements in the violent crime that's occurring in our city. We applied for a federal grant through the United States Department of Justice COPS program and we were awarded that grant for two additional officers. I will cover that grant as part of our uh, presentation. We also applied for a federal grant to assist us in dealing with the COVID-19 issues and covering our PPE and additional expenses. Some of that includes uh, testing for our officers and uh, for both COVID and antibodies. Uh, it covers a whole myriad of items so that we are using federal dollars to 
assist the department with uh, dealing with the COVID-19 issues. We've had two successful recruitment cycles in the last year. So what's that mean? So though that is us doing a, a testing cycle to hire new officers. And we've run two programs through and we have hired officers from that. And that is a very long and complex and program. So it starts with testing, uh, written tests, physical ability tests, very thorough backgrounds, psychological exams, medical exams, and the like uh, through that program. And initially in the interviews uh, for those officers, the police commission sits on that and approves our hiring list. So we have an independent oversight of that hiring list uh, built into our process before these officers are offered a place of employment with us. So through that, we have built uh, last year, the council gave us additional positions to take us to 114 staff. We are currently at 113 officers. Uh, we have six officers that graduated from the academy in June. Uh, they are currently out on the streets now in their field training cycle and will be uh, ready to go on their own uh, in the next few months. That uh, vacant position will be filled at the end of this month. So we will be at uh, 114 uniform strength. One of the things that uh, came out of last year's budget also was an independent staffing study. So this is a hired consultant outside of the police department and outside of the uh, city staff that has looked at our staffing, how we deploy our resources, and that study is nearing completion and we hope to leverage it. And I'll talk about that in, in some of our goals uh, coming forward, but that is nearing completion and will assist us in our efforts moving forward. Last year, the police department granted uh, chief's recruitment uh, to fill the chief vacancy, it was a national search. And part of that search included uh, community stakeholders, community members themselves that were able to interview the candidates. It included members of city council and included members of other city departments. Uh, trust me, it was a very thorough uh, two day cycle uh, to go, go through that. I thought it was very fair. I thought it was something that was allowed uh, the city to choose the candidate that, uh, that the community felt most comfortable with. So it was, it was definitely a, a great all around program. We have the crisis intervention training position. That is a grant to give us a new non-sworn position that will coordinate all of the training that goes with our critical incident response. And that is going to be uh, a position that will coordinate training for all first responders uh, in Missoula. So it will be a collaborative group effort. And one of the things I wanna talk about is the awards. So every year we do an, an annual awards presentation that is normally part of the uh, Peace Officers Memorial Week, but uh, unfortunately due to uh, the global circumstances, we had to cancel that. So I, I wanna talk about what those awards are. The first one's the life-saving medal. And that is awarded to officers who have saved a life. This is someone that the officer was able to save. In 2019, we had eight officers that saved 10 lives and they were awarded the life-saving medal for their heroic actions. We have a meritorious achievement award. That is for someone that goes above and beyond the normal call of service. We had an officer receive that. We had six officers that received the police medal. That is once again, uh, an act of valor that is placing themselves in harm's way to bring about uh, a resolution to a, an incident peacefully, 
helping bring restore peace to the community. And we had one Medal of Valor recipient. And that is when an officer places his or her life on the line in order to save someone in, in the public and uh, bring a peaceful resolution to that. So we had a lot of officers that went above and beyond the normal call of duty in order to provide assistance and life-saving measures to members of our community. I next wanna talk about some of the key goals as we move forward in fiscal year 21. The first one is to, to develop a department-specific strategic plan that supports the city's plan. Currently, the, the department does not have a police department specific plan. The idea is to take the goals and strategies from the city's plan and develop them into a plan that is specific to the police department and provides a better measure of our goals, holds us accountable to what we're trying to move forward and gives us a measuring barometer for our performance. That is currently underway uh, within the department and we'll be presenting that when it's complete. Next, in working with the mayor, we'd like to establish a public safety advisory committee that is made up of a representative uh, group of our community. And in that advisory committee, we would have discussions that regarding use of force policies, any other police department uh, activities where they could be a sounding board for us and we can be recipients of the information coming from our community that we serve so we can better serve them. I'd like to put together an annual report to the community that will have all of our statistics, uh, the things that we've done, the things that we've accomplished, reporting on our strategic goal progress, all of that will be included in this annual report. And that is another measure for transparency and being able to provide the community we serve with information that they are asking us for currently. We'd like to enhance our training program to ensure professional and ongoing development of our staff. And we'll talk about that during the training um, request. There is currently the mobile crisis uh, team that is being developed and we will be a strategic partner and a great stakeholder in that. We support that and we'll do everything we can to continue to make that a successful pilot program, hoping to make it a permanent program moving into the future. And finally, we'll talk a little bit about the independent staffing study. So it's still a draft form, but the fundamental piece of that staffing study is that the department is adequately uh, staffed at this point in time to make sure that we have the community oriented policing model. So what does that mean? So a community oriented policing model gold standard is for officers to have 50% uh, of their time dedicated to response for calls for service and 50% of their time dedicated to proactive community engagement. So based on the information from the staffing study with our current staffing level with the addition of the two officers we're asking for in the grant, we are able to attain that. Part of that also involves some efficiency changes that we need to make in regards to how we deploy our officers with their shifts. And we are currently working uh, through that. And we are also looking at uh, and proposing a new zone system for our calls for service that provide equal uh, distribution of calls across the city so we can better deploy our officers into those zones. And what does that do? That allows us to take that 50% of their time in that proactive mode. And when officers are, are assigned to the same zones, they get to learn the community. They get to learn the business owners. 
They get to learn the residents of that particular zone. So they can engage in those conversations and find out what's going on because they are not responding from call to call to call. They will actually have time to handle those community matters and start addressing uh, anything that pops up prior to it becoming a problem. And that is, and that information will come directly from the community because the officers are working within those zones. So those are all goals that we're uh, trying to push forward. So uh, moving into some statistical information, I want to talk a little bit about our uh, incidents or our calls for service. So our calls for service come from two places. One is a uh, call to uh, 911 or the police department through the desk and, and we respond. The other is officers uh, observing uh, something that is actionable and they initiate an enforcement contact. So in 2019, we responded to 60,191 incidents um, throughout the city. And to date, uh, in 2020, we have uh, handled 26,442 incidents. So I'm not going to go through this, but you will have this information available to you uh, because there's a lot of data there. You will see the, the types of calls for service that we have uh, responded to or self-generated. And uh, you'll be able to take a look at that information to see where all of those calls uh, and enforcement activities have taken place. And then same thing for 2020. Uh, we'll, this will be provided to you so you can take a look at it to make sure that you understand our calls for service. I think it's important, in addition to those uh, calls for service, as part of our community policing efforts, we have our downtown business improvement district officer. We have a quality of life sergeant that handles uh, community uh, events and, um, and community member um, discussions and, and disagreements. And during the off school hours, our school resource officers supplement this community oriented policing program uh, by getting on uh, bicycles and providing services uh, throughout the city. So you can see that in this model, we are providing extra uh, patrol in specific areas regarding parking and our parks and recreation area. And we're handling a lot of uh, inquiries from the public and uh, really engaging in that community oriented policing model. So you'll have the statistics there. Our community service specialists, these are not peace police officers, uh, but they do go out and engage in uh, activities that make our community healthy. So they're the ones that go out and deal with abandoned vehicles and uh, providing assistance to, to members of the public through inquiries and assistance, uh, handling some parking issues and things like that. And they also provide additional patrol through our trail system and our city park system uh, to be out there. So you'll have that information for you as well. This information is the key performance measures. And so what is this? This is what the department has used for many years to evaluate its performance. And in, in looking at these numbers, uh, from a historical perspective, I don't believe that it truly measures the, the success of the department. And this is going to be something through our strategic plan and our annual report that we're going to look to modify in order to provide the, the most effective and transparent picture of what the police department is doing within the city. But as a sense of transparency, wanted to ensure because this has been the traditional information that's been provided uh, throughout the years, I wanted to continue to provide that information uh, to both the council and the public. So let's talk about the behavioral and health related calls that, that we've responded to um, in, in, in the city. And this, and this goes to 
uh, discussion about the mobile uh, crisis team and our crisis intervention uh, training component. So most of those incidents are captured under three types of calls, welfare checks, suicidal persons, and emergency evaluations. So you can see that in 2019, there were 2,547 2, welfare checks, 711 suicidal uh, persons calls, and 259 emergency evaluation calls. So our response to those calls have always been first to make sure that the person involved and the public is safe, and then make sure that uh, we get them the appropriate resources that they need. And for 2019, that represented about 5% of our total calls for service was handling behavioral and health related calls. Our use of force policy uh, authorizes objectively reasonable force and compliance with constitutional and statutory provisions. It emphasizes de-escalation and requires us to document and review each incident. Uh, as I spoke to council uh, a few months back, we have reviewed that policy. We are currently uh, revising that policy and providing some amendments to it. It is still not finalized at this point in time. However, I could tell you that uh, one of the issues that was discussed was the eight can't wait uh, items. And the department's policy already contained six of those items explicitly. And the new policy does contain all eight of those. Uh, once it's uh, finalized uh, through the process and ready for presentation, I'll bring it forward to you. So let's talk about our use of force incidents that occurred in 2019. So we had of those 60,171 incidents uh, that we handled, there were 172 incidents of force. So what's an incident of force? An incident of force could be anything from uh, a control hold to uh, overcome the resistance of a non-compliant subject all the way up through the use of deadly force, um, tasers, OC spray. And because we want to be a 100% transparent, the department also captures data when officers display the use of a firearm or display their taser and use verbal commands to uh, get the person to voluntarily comply. Um, so some departments don't categorize that as use of force. We do because we want to capture that information as a sense of transparency to the community. So those 172 incidents encompass all of those, um, all of that range of our use of force continuum. So if you take that number, you can see that that represents 0.28%. So 0.28%, it's less than a third of a percent of all of the incidents involving the Missoula Police Department resulted in us, document, uh, us documenting a use of force. The national average based on a 2018 United States Department of Justice study is 2% of law enforcement contacts nationwide result in uh, some use of force or threatened use of force with the displaying of a taser or a firearm. So we are well below the national average when it comes to our use of force. So let's talk about uh, complaints and resolutions. So we have a independent police commission that reviews all of our citizens' complaints. So every single one of those complaints that we receive is taken seriously and we investigate it. And at the conclusion of that investigation, that investigation is presented to the police commission for review and oversight. So they review those and either agree or ask us to go back and get more facts uh, and continue the investigation. So it is every single aspect of that complaint has been investigated. In 2019, we had 26 complaints 
that had 51 allegations. So what does that mean? We had 26 individuals that filed formal complaints against an officer. Some of those complaints had a few, one, two, three allegations of misconduct by the officer. So that's how we get to 51 allegations. So that represents 0.04% of our total contacts. So to me, that says that our officers are handling business in a professional and compassionate manner when they are contacting the public. So if we break down those 51 allegations, there was only one for excessive force and one for bias. And in both of those situations, the officer was exonerated. Overall, 22 of those allegations were exonerated, which means that the officer's conduct was within policy and the law. Four were not sustained, which meant that there was insufficient evidence to prove or disprove the allegation. Five were sustained, which meant that the officer's conduct was not within policy. 15 were unfounded, which means the allegation did not occur. And five resulted in no finding, which usually happens when the complainant withdraws the complaint against the officer or fails to assist us in the investigation and provide us the information we need to continue to move forward. Once again, every single one of these complaints and their findings were reviewed and approved by the Independent Police Commission. So I want to move into the new fiscal year requests uh, for what we're asking for in this upcoming budget year. So request number one is for our COPS grant for two officers. So that comes from the award of a federal COPS grant for two officers. The grant overall will pay $125,000 over three years for each officer. So that means that uh, we will have this grant cover $250,000 over the course of those three years for these two officers. One of those officers will be dedicated to the downtown uh, business area, riverfront and west side areas, which will help improve our already existing uh, business improvement district program, which once again is a model of community oriented policing where we uh, our officer is out uh, solving issues, not necessarily with enforcement, but with compassion and linking with uh, assistance from social workers from uh, the university and really addressing uh, the true root of issues uh, going on within that district and the population that we serve there. So this officer will be dedicated and allow us to expand that already successful program. Under the current contract that we have with the Business Improvement District, there is language in there to also help offset uh, expenses related uh, to the salary of this officer, and that would equate to $79,000 over the course of the same three years for that one particular officer. The Second officer that we were awarded the grant for is for uh, digital forensic evidence officer. So currently the, our digital forensics program is uh, an ancillary duty for one of our detectives. So one of our detectives who is investigating cases and, and investigating uh, those crimes has an ancillary duty of doing digital forensics. What is digital forensics? In today's world, uh, there's a lot of information uh, associated with the investigation that comes from cell phones, um, digital uh, pads, um, notebooks, computers. Uh, there's information in, uh, in vehicles and, and that type of thing. So we have to be able to, after we secure proper warrants based on probable cause, be able to download and get the information we need from those devices. So this officer is part of uh, ancillary duties. Does that work? The issue that we've had is that 
based on the types of crimes and in our modern society, there is a lot of digital evidence and forensics work that we need to do. And the ancillary part of that responsibility has become way more than an ancillary duty to the extent that we need a full-time position to just do that. And that would allow us to um, get that detective position back to handling a full caseload in investigating crimes. So that's what the digital forensics officer position is. Hey, Chief, do you mind before, if we pause before going to the next request, um, want to check in with, I've, I've got a, Sandra, I think has a question. Yes, thank you. Um, on one of the earlier slides um, with the officer complaints, there were five sustained. What happened to those officers? Uh, they received uh, a level of discipline, level um, either from a, uh, a written reprimand um, through formal discipline. Okay, thank you. Chief, if I could, um, the the downtown um, the ID officer is something I'm intimately familiar with, uh, with Ward 1 and the success Randy's had there. Um, I think you spoke to this, but is it your, uh, is there a commitment to continue to pair that second officer with the, um, the social work um, resource uh, like we've been able to do with Randy? Yes, that is our goal to continue that program uh, as it is and expand it. Okay, thanks. Let's go ahead and go to the second request. So the second request is uh, court enhanced training. So the idea here is that we have to develop a, a continuum of professional education and development of our officers. With the current resource that we have, a lot of that is, a lot of that resource is taken by required training that we have to do to meet state mandates through post. And we don't have the ability to develop this professional development track for our officers. We believe that a highly trained and educated officer provides better service to the public. So we took uh, a, a different approach to developing that ongoing training curriculum and development for our officers. And we broke it down into three components. The first component is a community oriented policing training program. This is where we are going to train our officers and all, um, all officers in implicit bias training, de-escalation training, our ongoing uh, crisis intervention training, use of force training, defensive tactics training, and AELE is the uh, Americans for, um, oh shoot, the E just escaped me. Um, for, it, it's a nonprofit think tank that develops training programs for uh, supervisory personnel within pol the police world to, as you can see below, take a look at those items that does uh, uh, American education um, for law enforcement. So it takes a look at, and we will send our supervisors to this special training that allows them to provide enhanced oversight and supervision in areas involving force and in areas involving discipline and internal investigations in management and oversight of those critical items that the public is asking us to make sure that we are holding our people accountable. In order for us to do that, we need to provide specialized training for our supervisors to do this. So the budget figure for providing this training uh, for the, if there's travel, 
if there is something that we have to pay tuition for, if there is something that we will be hiring an outside uh, vendor or provider for, uh, we have uh, gotten information to provide the quote of $51,269 in order to provide this enhanced training uh, for our community-oriented policing program. Next is the budget request for the training component for our patrol division. And the what we're trying to do here is we have our new officers that come out of the academy and they receive all of their academy training. We do our additional training in our mini academy and through their orientation. And then um, once they're through their field training program, they are on the streets. Uh, taking calls and, and, and doing work. So what we wanted to do is develop that, that career track of providing officers in the two to five year range with uh, certain courses and officers from the five uh, to 15 year range, uh, additional advanced courses, because as you, uh, as you gain experience, um, doing the job, and as you gain additional training, some of that's going to be foundational uh, and intermediate in the beginning. But as you develop those skills and training sets, then we need to provide you with more advanced training. So uh, what we're looking at is um, a DUI component, a basic interview component, a tactical medical program. So what that is is for officers. Um, if they get wounded in the line of duty and or uh, helping uh, any member of the public uh, prior to fire uh, and medical arriving on scene, uh, handling basic crime scenes. Uh, IGO is uh, individual group and organizational uh, leadership. So that is a, a leadership program, enhanced patrol techniques and street crimes and that additional training uh, budgeted is $36,256. And the last uh, unit is our detective division. So on average, uh, due to uh, retirements and promotion, we end up with five new officers uh, in, our, in our detective classification, and we need to provide them with a uh, basic level of uh, Detective school, uh, so you'll see you'll see that uh, death investigation includes unintended death, uh, homicides, and, and that type of thing. Advanced crime scene is a two-week course, and um, the FETI is a victim-centered approach to doing interviews and uh, child interview, and then we have a, an advanced interview course. So once again, this is taking our detectives from beginning through their uh, development as detect becoming more senior detectives, providing them with the track to maintain and grow uh, professionally uh, through their education and training. One of the things that happens when we have when we provide training to our officers is that we have to pull them from their normal duties, whether they're on patrol or handling something uh, in the and doing investigations within the detective division. So we estimate that we can, and we have to backfill that work. We still have to provide 24 seven coverage for calls for service to our community. And we have to backfill those officers. Based on our schedules and how we're able to accomplish that training, we estimate that 30% of the coverage uh, for those 24-7 uh, would need to be done through uh, paying overtime to backfill those officers that are in training. And that overtime budget uh, to accomplish that is $77,352. And then in the training um, request, there is a one-time request for a $25,000 upgrade to our force option simulator. So what's the force option simulator? The force option simulator is a video and computer based program 
that puts officers into various scenarios um, and they will uh, work through their scenarios and how the officer uh, reacts to what is on the screen dictates how the, the subject in that video will react to them. And we use that training for, we use that video system for our de-escalation crisis intervention and use of force training. It allows us to do that training in a realistic and virtual world. Um, and our force option simulator that we currently have uh, is no longer functional. And this is a request to upgrade that simulator to make it functional so that we can do all of those other uh, enhanced trainings and ongoing training. The, the beautiful part about a force option simulator is that uh, if we are having a routine training day, uh, we can put an officer in that training environment and they can go through a half hour, one hour of, of something uh, as part of their normal training day. So it is something that allows us to solidify, verify, and keep officers current and refreshed in all of those uh, critical uh, training components of de-escalation, crisis intervention, and use of force. So Jim, before- uh, I ask you to pause for a question from Councilwoman Harp. Uh, Chief White, could you go to the screen before, please? Yes. Um, in, in regards to this force option simulator, is that one and the same that has been used with, within the police, uh, um, sorry, the local government police academy that has been open to the public so that those people who sign up for that particular program can actually kind of understand uh, what es how to actually de-escalate? Yes, it is the same, same one. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, go ahead. Uh, request number three are baseline adjustments uh, for increased uh, costs associated with uh, ongoing pros, uh, programs and, and licensing. These are existing contracts that uh, due to um, additional expenses uh, for the licenses and uh, programs that so we need additional funding to cover those ongoing programs. Request number four uh, is uh, patrol vehicle and special teams vehicles. So let's first talk about the patrol vehicle. I did bring a picture of it, but the first request is for uh, a new departmental motorcycle. We have five departmental motorcycles. In last year's uh, budget, we were approved and, and got four motorcycles. One was uh, not requested. And so we have been short one motorcycle. So the first part of this request is for that fifth motorcycle as a replacement to a current fleet motorcycle so that we can have a complete uh, motorcycle unit and traffic unit. Any questions about that before I move to the other vehicle? Chief, real quickly, did so would we have seen that we did a, we had a fleet and facilities review, I don't, and I don't recall specifically, would that have been in their um, request or is that part of the PD request? It is part of the PD request. Okay. So the way that works, Mr. Chairman, is uh, we, uh, if, if we do not have a vehicle or a piece of equipment in our replacement cycle, that comes as a new request from the department. Once that uh, piece of equipment is in that replacement cycle, then that would come from fleet. Right. I forgot that. Um, Ms. Merritt. Uh, typically, Chief, um, with the, when we get these types of um, presentation from fleet for vehicles, they give us a little bit of detail about the age of the vehicle that's being replaced and uh, what will happen with the one that we currently have, if it's going to be moved to someplace else or sold. Can you give us some detail about this motorcycle? Uh, so that, that, be, that motorcycle is um, not currently in use for enforcement purposes because I don't have the mileage off the top of my head. Uh, I can get that for you for certain. 
uh, but that vehicle, uh, that motorcycle now is uh, simply used as a training motorcycle. So when our officers are doing motorcycle training, um, it's not going to be surplused out. We'd like, we've uh, kept that vehicle uh, to use in our training environment uh, because that is uh, significantly harsher on our vehicles in that training environment than in the streets and, uh, doing enforcement activities. So uh, we would prefer to um, use that motorcycle in, in that training capacity. But I will make a note to get you the information about what year that motorcycle is. You can go ahead, Chief. So um, the next I want to talk about the special teams equipment vehicle. And uh, I want to talk about what it is and what it is not. First of all, it is not a armored personnel carrier. It has zero armor to it. It is a van that the department has used to transport uh, our special teams equipment uh, to critical incidents. Uh, the vehicle that you see at the top of your screen in blue uh, is a vehicle that the department has had uh, for the past 11 years. It is a 1981 uh, vehicle and um, the motor uh, went bad um, and uh, it doesn't work. And it's been out of service for over a year and it is a vehicle that uh, is not worth the cost of replacing the motor for. It is, has zero armor. It is merely meant as a vehicle to transport the equipment for our special teams to the critical incident. So all we're asking for is a replacement. So what have we done in the last year? So in the last year, we have um, used a, uh, a trailer, a box trailer uh, from another city entity uh, that they have graciously loaned us in order to uh, get our equipment to these incidents. And the trailer uh, poses us a lot of logistical uh, issues when it comes to providing resource immediately to uh, the incident because we usually, we, we only have a few departmental vehicles, i.e. pickups, that are able to tow the trailer. So when time is of the essence, we have to take a resource that is currently deployed within that incident to go to the yard to get the trailer with the necessary equipment and, and respond to the scene. The other issue that we have is that um, we are pushing the gross vehicle weight rating of those pickups the city currently, the police department currently has in order to tow that vehicle. So um, it, is, it is definitely a, a, a situation that is something we've had to implement to overcome the issue, but it is not an optimum response when time is of the essence and public safety and lives hang in the balance. So this request is to uh, get another van. Once again, without armor, uh, you can see uh, the, the van that was uh, white in color on the first page uh, was a van similar to the one that we've been looking at. And uh, on the left-hand side, you can see the interior of the old uh, 1990 van uh, that uh, is no longer serviceable. And the uh, picture on the right is the proposed trailer or proposed uh, truck that is uh, similar that will just be a, a vehicle to transport gear. So any questions about that? Yeah, vehicle? I'm not sure. Heidi, did you have a question? Go ahead, Heidi. All right, um, I guess I was wondering if you could provide some examples of when this sort of a vehicle has responded in, I don't know, the last year or in its history? Yeah, absolutely. So um, just in my time here alone, uh, we have had three special teams deployments. 
So uh, in the last uh, four or five months, um, we have deployed that vehicle three times. And Chief, why don't you go ahead and describe what one of those call outs looks like? You just anticipated my question, thank you. So um, the, the times that uh, they've been called out uh, or have been um, in the process of being called out uh, has had to do with incidents uh, where uh, the subject has a firearm and has threatened uh, a, a member of their household, have threatened members of uh, the public, and we need to be able to provide a safe response uh, to that critical incident where someone is armed with a firearm and has either used it, uh, such in the case of, of uh, an incident on Beckwith, uh, or has threatened to use it, and we need to ensure that we uh, get the proper properly trained and equipped personnel to a scene to evacuate nearby uh, apartments um, and or nearby homes to that incident. And we need the, that specialized equipment and training in order to uh, make the public and our officers safe in trying to resolve that issue. Does that answer your question? I think so. In not seeing other hands from council members, you can go to number five. Okay, request number five is for uh, command staff vehicles. So it's, a, it's an ask for four vehicles. So two of the current four vehicles are not in the current replacement cycle. So they will never get replaced unless we ask because they are not part of that rotation. And one of those uh, was an asset forfeiture vehicle that the city obtained quite some time ago. The other vehicle uh, for unknown reason, uh, yet to be, we haven't been able to figure out why it's not in the rotation because it was uh, a vehicle that was part of the fleet at one point in time, but uh, for some reason is a part of the rotation of, of replacement. So, uh, so, and those two vehicles, one of which is uh, an old Chevy Tahoe, um, is beyond its service life. That is the one that was asset forfeiture vehicle. Uh, that's a picture of it there on the left. Uh, it's got over 165,000 miles on it and it's 18 years old. And you can go back. And the other vehicle is a uh, 2012 uh, Ford Escape. Um, that is nearing the end of its service life, but once again is not on the replacement schedule. So what are we gonna do with, with these vehicles? We're going to take two of the vehicles um, that are uh, serviceable and in the rotation schedule and reallocate them to our detective division because we are two vehicles short in our detective division. So in order to get um, our detectives the resources they need in order to handle uh, investigations and calls, um, we need these two additional vehicles in order to do that. The vehicle, the 2012 uh, Ford Escape that's nearing the end of life, uh, we will reallocate as our volunteer vehicle. Our volunteer vehicle is also a vehicle that is uh, at one point in time, um, not on the rotation of uh, replacement vehicles. It is a 2007 Ford Escape that is at the end of its service life. So we will um, take that uh, 2007 vehicle, uh, turn it in for uh, surplus. We will take the uh, Tahoe that is beyond its service life uh, and turn it in. So although there is an ask for four vehicles, the net increase to the actual department fleet is two vehicles, uh, which we need for our detective division. So the proposed staff vehicle um, is uh, what you see there, something similar to uh, the 
the Ford um, Explorer. And we, we one another reason for that, Dodge stopped making the Charger as a police um, enforcement vehicle. So in last year's budget, uh, when we were buying replacement patrol cars, the department had to go with this new, with the Ford vehicle because the Charger vehicle is no longer available. So in order to maintain uniformity of fleet for basic uh, maintenance, uh, outfitting of uh, radio equipment, uh, so we can take what we currently have and reuse it um, and, 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 and maintain uh, the ability to have uniformity in the fleet. Uh, we pro are proposing uh, to use the Ford Explorer as a base model for that. Any questions about those vehicles? Chief, the, could you describe the volunteers? Yeah, it is a 2007 uh, Ford Escape. Uh, and it is, uh, uh, the number of miles on it, I don't know, but it is, uh, it is a maintenance challenge for us. It is, um, the, I, I was just looked at it because I parked next to it th today and uh, you know, the seats are torn in it just from, just from use and, and where. Councilman, are you asking about the nature of our volunteer program? Yes, thank you. Oh, I thought you meant about the volunteer vehicle. I, my apology. No, no, so, I, I didn't clarify. I was just about to try to. <laughs> so uh, the volunteer program, uh, is uh, made up of community members that donate their time to assist the police department and assist the community. So they do uh, quite a bit of work in uh, graffiti abatement. They do work with making sure that all of our patrol vehicles are equipped with all the forms and papers and items that our officers need uh, in their trunks uh, to go out to do uh, their work. They do a lot of found property um, management. So whenever uh, someone brings in found property in the community, our volunteers do a lot of work to try to reunite that item with its owner. And we are extremely successful just in the time I've been here. We've had uh, wedding rings, uh, college rings, and, and items like that through our volunteer program, return to the rightful owners. Uh, so those those are just a few of the things that the volunteer program helped us do. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. Oh, the, the other thing that our volunteers do is, uh, is, uh, is handle uh, bicycles. Uh, unfortunately, in the city, we have a lot of bicycles that are uh, abandoned, turned in, um, and when we go to auction those bicycles off, if we can't find the owner after proper notice, um, they handle a lot of that bicycle processing and, and sell. So they do a lot of great work for us. So helm, uh, number six is PPE helmets. So these are helmets that will, uh, we're gonna stop sharing just so you can, can you see? We can see you now. So I, I wanna talk about what these helmets are and what they're not. These helmets are for the personal protection of our officers in critical incidents. Our officers respond to multiple incidents involving the threatened use of firearms or the actual use of firearms and a ballistic rated helmet is a fundamental piece of police protective equipment in those critical incidents. As I mentioned, just in the time I've been here, there have been three calls where our patrol officers would have been able to use this protective piece of equipment to uh, help them be safe on these critical incidents. One of those occurred on Beckwith uh, back in April where a gentleman stepped uh, out onto the porch 
and was firing a semi-automatic rifle um, within the neighborhood. Our officers responded to that incident. And while they have vests that protect their core vital organs, they don't have a helmet to protect the other vital organ of their brain. So our officers were behind trees, they were behind cars as this subject fired weapons in the general area. Through proper de-escalation and, and their negotiations and, and conduct with this uh, individual, we were able to resolve it, they were able to resolve it without police having to fire any shots. But nonetheless, they had to put themselves into harm's way in order to resolve that situation peacefully. So during that incident where our officers didn't have uh, these helmets, several years ago, the fire department through an active shooter grant were able to obtain um, a, a number of ballistic rated helmets that the fire department has for their firefighters to respond to active shooter and these critical incidents. So as our officers are literally across the street behind trees uh, as this subject is firing a weapon, the fire department with the helmet that our officers could be using have those helmets with them for their firefighters staged a few blocks away um, out of the out of that initial danger zone until our officers are able to render it safe. So what I have here is, and I'll try to hold it against the contrast of the table so you can see it better, is the fire department's ballistic rated helmet. So this is a helmet that is designed to provide protection to the other vital organ of our officers as they're dealing with critical incidents. Much like our firefighters have a helmet to uh, enter fires and other hazardous situations to protect their vital organs. And, and, these, and the helmets are something that we need to have immediately available. We, we, we can never plan for a critical incident or when uh, you're going to need it. It is something that officers are going to need to be issued and have with them within their patrol car because when seconds matter in an active shooter situation at a gathering, at a school, uh, our officers need to be able to immediately grab that piece of equipment and not come back to a station in order to grab, um, you know, from a pool of, uh, of helmets. It is something that they need to carry individually and have with them uh, to be able to respond to these. Questions? If you've got the cost in the re new request form on the budget website, it, it's I don't see it in the presentation. Is it, could we add that or? Yeah, the, the, the cost is $34,800. And could you speak to, or go ahead, Julie. And I was gonna just clarify, that is to buy a, a helmet for every officer. So 116 helmets, yes. talking about? Yes. Okay. Chief, can you explain, um, does every officer need one because it's part of their personal gear or are they use and obviously we don't deploy 116 officers to particular incident um but that becomes a that would become part of a their personal equipment yes it would it would, it would be uh, issued to them like the rest of their police safety gear and and you have and every officer needs to have one because if we do have uh, an active shooter situation everyone is going to go uh, detectives uh, are going to be are, are going to be responding. Um, our school resource officers would be responding. So it is it would 
need to be a personally issued item um, and is and is something that um, you know what what you wear you kind of need to own it. <laughs> Got it. Uh, Councilwoman Harp. Uh, the other thing is size too. Um, you know, it's they're not they're not a uniform size. They come in various sizes. So, uh, in order to yeah, like so so you can see by it, that one doesn't quite fit the mayor. So we would need to have appropriately sized um, helmets for each individual officer. Ms. Harp. Thank you. Um, I, I really have appreciated um, the time you've taken, Chief White, of uh, really trying to um, lay out before us all the different kinds of requests. And it seems like in the this being the third year I've done this, um, we, we recognize that there's always more need than we have dollars for. Um, you know, the helmets that you speak to, um, I, I, it makes a lot of sense. And if I can just lay out two names in front of everybody as just gentle reminders of how dangerous the job is that you, that you do. One is um, uh, City Sergeant Bob Heinley and our Highway Patrolman, Wade Palmer, who both uh, suffered just tragic um, changes in their life because of the work that they do. Um, and whether or not this helmet is the right solution to what, what happened to them is beside the point, but it's, it's prioritizing the safety of our officers, which I do appreciate. However, we have had an un, a remarkable um, sentiment in our, from our public speaking to us counselors in, in roughly 1,500 emails that have come in around Black Lives Matter, Affordable Housing Trust Fund, the Mobile Crisis Unit, and um, reforming our, our police department. It's not a one-off. This is, this is definitely something that is very, very, um, very much on the minds of, of everyone in our community. And, and what, what I did not realize before was that we had instances of discrimination against people of color that were happening in our community that I don't believe ends up being reported. Or if it is, that bias somehow is, as it goes through the police commission, doesn't materialize into any, um, any outcomes that I think produce better results for our, for our public. And to that end, when you, when you earlier in your first request was um, referring back to the training on crisis intervention and implicit bias training, I, I wonder if you have really given thought about how we can improve outcomes so that uh, our 116 officers, not only do they have good training in both firearms and use of force, which is, we recognize is part of the job, but that implicit bias training and crisis intervention training match hour for hour for those same hours that they are being trained for use of force, which ultimately, as we, as you showed us, produces a very small percentage of the work that our officers do. And I'm wondering if you can speak to uh, more about the training aspect and what your, what what your expectations are of, of our officers so that they are put on a, on a positive footing with our community members. Yeah, absolutely. So our, our training plan, and while there may be a, a, a defined number of hours for implicit bias trainings. So for example, um, an, an eight hour course, a 16 hour course, that is something that we're going to have to develop with our um, our vendor and in consultation with our community. That's when you build an implicit bias training program based on my experience is that you bring in the community into that uh, into that development and you build the training course specific to the needs of your community. That's what yields the results. So my expectation is that we are going to build a training course that is commensurate with what we need to do for our community. That being said, 
the most important feature of any of these trainings, whether it be critical incident, um, whether it be de-escalation, whether it be implicit bias, is that you do wrap around training uh, through any of our courses. You, you weave in implicit bias training, de-escalation training, critical incident training. So those are ongoing in nature. So it's, it's um, think of it as uh, getting a shot when you're a child and um, you, know, you, you get boosters, right? So it, it's one of those things where it's not just that initial training piece, it is that ongoing discussion about those particular training aspects that lead to results. So when, when we talk about trying to measure results, that's why uh, we're looking at that strategic plan. And part of our strategic plan is going to include, include that community engagement piece where we can measure in a realistic and meaningful way how we're doing. And, and we can see how that training is working or if we need to adjust it to better meet the mark. So that's, that's the reason for all of this encompassing requests and coupled with the strategic plan so we can meet those goals of our community. Thank you, Chief White. And Brian, if I might have one follow-up. Is it on the training topic? Um, yes. Is there a chance, Heather, you could hold it? I I'd like to get through. There's one more request and then the CAP. And then I think that several of us have questions about this. Um, sure, I can wait. OK, thanks. Heidi, likewise, I see your hand up. Is it um, on this request, or can it wait till we get through those? Uh I can wait. Okay, I appreciate it. I just like to, I'd like to get through these because I think several of us have a lot of questions back on some of the earlier material. So why don't you go through the cameras and then the CIP? Yes, sir. So request number seven is for camera systems. So this proposal would ensure that we have one hundred percent deployment of body worn uh, cameras uh, in the field and uh, also one hundred percent. Uh, cameras in our vehicles. So what does that look like? The request is for, we, we currently have 40 body worn cameras, uh, but based on uh, battery life, uh, storage downloads and those types of things, um, they're not always able to be fully functional for entire shift. So, and we have several that malfunction that we have to send back for repair and those types of things. So the request is for five patro uh, patrol vehicle, or sorry, six patrol vehicle systems, which include a body worn camera as part of the package and 10 additional body worn cameras uh, that would be available as uh, backups and things like that. So we can always ensure that every single officer that it goes out on patrol has a body worn, fully functioning body worn camera. The other piece of this system uh, request is for our interview rooms. Our interview rooms currently have a, a different manufacturer system that uh, is reaching the uh, end of life and we have six of those interview rooms that we need to outfit with the new camera system. The proposal puts us on a uniform platform of video cameras. So what does that mean? It means that all of the video associated with a particular incident is all contained in one incident file. So for example, an officer activates the patrol lights on a patrol vehicle, that automatically initiates the recording for both the patrol vehicle camera 
and it activates the body worn camera at the same time, automatically, electronically. So once the officer has finished on the street and needs to interview someone uh, back at the station, when you activate this camera system in those interview rooms, you're able to create, based on the incident, a file that joins all three of those videos together, syncs them with date and timestamps, and allows you to play them simultaneously so you can see all the different views. And it also allows us to better process them uh, for evidence purposes with the courts uh, and uh, with the prosecutor's office. And it allows us to streamline onto one single platform all of our uh, digital video. Within that proposal is also the infrastructure um, that we need for the IT support, which will include uh, the increased storage and uh, servers that we need in order to be able to transfer that data. So all of that is included in that uh, one particular cost. The community investment program is for uh, locker rooms and security at the Catlin facility. So I first wanna talk about the, what's going to, what, what is proposed to be the shower room. So when the, when the facility was, um, remodeled uh, before the police department took occupancy. There is uh, this one bathroom that wasn't a part of that initial remodel. This is still the original uh, with some new paint. So it is a, a small room and uh, there is uh, restroom facilities and, um, and sinks in there. There is zero shower facilities at the Catlin facility. So um, the next slide is, this is the architect's rendition and engineer's rendition of what we're trying to do. On the left, you'll see that uh, there would be a shower installed and um, it would just be changed out for uh, a, a toilet and a sink. So why is it that we need a shower facility? Well, our officers throughout the course of their, their job are exposed to, to many hazards, uh, biohazards, chemical hazards, and the like. They get, uh, they get awfully dirty uh, some days out there in, in their job, and they don't have a place to clean up. And as it, as it sits now, our officers have to take that contamination and um, biological hazards home with them in order to change their clothes and get clean. So they're having to leave their duty uh, to respond to their residents to change their clothes and get clean in order to return back to work. And particularly in today's pandemic with COVID-19, this has really been something that we um, would, would hope to be able to address and provide uh, a level of uh, health safety for our officers and our personnel. So this shower facility will be a gender neutral uh, restroom facility. So it will be used by, uh, or could be used by all members of the department. We're not asking for any separated uh, large scale locker rooms with showers. This is a simple bathroom with a shower in it uh, in order for our officers to get clean uh, should they get dirty. Another piece of this request is the locker room facility. There is currently no locker room available for our officers to change clothes. They have no place to store any of their police equipment and or uh, personal equipment. So that requires our officers to drive their personal vehicles with all of their police safety gear um, and their uniforms on prior to coming to work because they do not have a place to come in their personal attire 
and change into their uniforms and report for duty. And at the end of their shift, change back into their personal attire um, and uh, go home or have a place to keep an extra set of uniforms in order to change uh, clothes should they get uh, exposed uh, or become dirty to the point that they need to, to take a shower and change their uniforms. So this proposal would add um, very modest locker room facilities. So the picture on the left is upstairs in the Catlin facility, and it is currently used as a break area. And the proposal uh, would be to create a women's locker room uh, within that space by building a wall along, you see the, the heavy steel beams for the roof, would be to build a wall along that um, and reconfigure that break area, um, which would be cut in half, but still available for use as a break area and provide a uh, private locker room facility for, uh, for the women of the department. And the picture that you see on the right is another piece, uh, another room that is upstairs and it currently just has racks that we keep supplies on. We have already found other space to be able to move those supplies to without impacting any other space. And what we would do in this room is um, simply remove those uh, wooden racks and put in appropriate locker space uh, to be able for a men's locker room. So what you'll see here is a rendition and there it's, basically the same plans. And we had different options to try to configure and maximize the space for the number of lockers that we need uh, in order to give everyone a locker. And just so you know, uh, the one on the left is the layout uh, that, that works for us. The lockers in there uh, won't be full-size lockers because there's not sufficient space to give everyone a full-size locker. They will be half lockers. Um, which means that um, they will be able to keep a change of clothes and their basic gear in there. Um, it is, they're, they're, there's not a lot of space for uh, a, a lot of other things. It'll be just an opportunity for them to, uh, as a place to change their clothes uh, at the beginning of shift, end of shift, and when necessary, uh, should they become exposed to something. So cost breakdown. I've talked about the locker room and the shower. So the, the CIP has uh, a global cost. The first part of that cost is for the shower and locker room. And the cost for that is the $199,367. The other piece of the CIP is for security fencing and a gate. So let me talk about what that $62,000 represents. Currently at the Catlin facility, there, the parking lot is secure only on the back portion of the building. And it does not provide us with adequate secure parking for our police vehicles. And it also allows uh, for two doors to be um, outside of that perimeter that doesn't have a secondary point of security. So what the, what the proposal for with the security fencing and gate is to extend the current fencing to go all the way out uh, to the front of the building. There'll still be a public access. No, you wouldn't have to go through a gate or a fence in order to to access the building from the public side. And that would allow us to have adequate secure parking for our patrol vehicles and, uh, and better security for the facility itself. And the gate is uh, an, an automatic gate. So uh, it's one of, those, uh, one of those items that if you, you drive on it and it lifts up and, and, and we can get out and there's a punch code to get in 
uh, to the secure parking to be able to park our vehicles. There is already an existing gate there um, that we would leave in place as a redundancy system because uh, that gate cycles uh, a lot and uh, it is prone to malfunction uh, just from, uh, from a lot of use and particularly in the winter time uh, during uh, heavy snow loads and or uh, cold snaps with ice and things like that. Um, sometimes that can cause issues. So we wanna be able to still be able to provide rapid uh, response and uh, be able to get out of the facility um, and at the same time provide security for the facility, which is why we would have a redundant system of security. So just as a comparison uh, to some of our neighboring Montana cities and what their police department budgets look like uh, compared to uh, the city of Missoula. So uh, you can see the number sworn total city budget, the populations, the population of um, per officer and the budget per capita and then the budget per officer. So you can see that uh, our city is in line with uh, comparable Montana law enforcement agencies as a, as a comparison to other police departments. Thanks, Chief. Um, I'm gonna, I know there's a queue of folks and we will get to public comment as well. Um, I want to uh, go back to Heather. Thanks for your patience, Heather. Um, sorry to disrupt your question before. Oh, sure. No problem. Let me just turn my fan on. Um, okay. So in regards to training, uh, Chief White, uh, one of the things that we, we've gone through in, in terms of our um, ad hoc committee is working with the LEARN project and their qualitative research that they're working on. Can you talk about how what that qualitative research and how that's going to um, play into your, your approach to implicit bias training and um, creating more of a positive community policing force. So that is all very relevant data to how we're going to build our, our, our program. So, um, you know, we, we are working with uh, them now to, uh, and we've entered into discussions about what type of data we collect uh, what type of data uh, that we don't collect, and that is all going to be uh, a part of that discussion uh, based on data, based on input. Um, the training that we develop isn't going to be something that we just build and say, yeah, we're good. It's something that's going to take a bit of time, and we are open to the input and suggestions that we get from, from LEARN, and a variety of other sources. Thank you very much. Uh, Heidi, I had asked you to wait. Go ahead. I, I guess I had a question about um, the use of the helmets. Um, I understand that they're intended to be ballistic helmets um, for use uh, when there is an active shooter situation um, and that there really isn't a use outside of that. And I guess my question is, um around i guess like agency directive on when they are uh, appropriate to be used and when they aren't as an officer safety issue the officers need to be able to use that helmet whenever they are facing a dangerous situation so whether that be uh, the service of an arrest warrant or a search warrant uh, when there is uh, the, the potential of harm, uh, firearms, those types of things. So there's, there's, it, it's the policy and expected use is for the protection of the officer. And the officer needs to be able to use proper professional discretion as to when that officer believes that they need to don a piece of protective equipment. We can't, we can't cover 100% uh, of the possibilities. It's going to have to be based on a case-by-case -case professional judgment of the involved officer.
Um, Chief, could I, I, I want to follow up on that one. Um, I would not, I, I understand the flexibility. I don't think I nor the public would want to see officers with those helmets during, for instance, a protest. Um, can you speak to that? Understanding that peaceful, de peaceful, peaceful demonstration isn't going to result in a police response of that nature. However, if the situation got to a point where it was unpeaceful and it was riotous and there were uh, people that were um, damaging buildings, uh, hurting other individuals, uh, throwing rocks and bottles and things like that, um, then our officers should be able to be able to provide, uh, put on a piece of protective equipment to address that global public safety issue that is quite hazardous to them and the public that's there in order to address it. For a simple peaceful demonstration uh, that we've been having at the county courthouse, for example, is not something that you would find an officer uh, walking around with a helmet on. I'm going to keep going through my queue. Uh, Amber. Okay, I have I have a few questions. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, uh, first, um, Chief White, thanks for the presentation. And as far as the shower and the locker room facility, do you, have you gotten bids on that? Where did that number come from? And then, do you know what the with the 199? What was the breakdown between the locker room and the shower? If you've gotten bids. So we have not been able to get bids. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we had funding. The, those numbers are uh, very educated estimates uh, from the from the initial firm that we engineering firm that we used to uh, take a look to try to develop scope and global costs associated with that project. But it has not gone out to bid because we do not have the funding. And, okay. and I, would, I would just add to that, Councilwoman, that we um, we would intend to fund this through the redevelopment agency, but we wanted to get CIP approval from Council. These are eligible costs for the Urban Renewal District. Okay, thanks. And so I'm kind of going. I'm going to go back back because I was making notes through your presentation. But um, with the the data with the with the um, either civilian initiated responses or um, police or responses versus self-generated calls. Do you know what the breakdown between those? I couldn't read all the really little. Um, so it doesn't break it down. The, the data that we, that we have does not break down um, a call that we received through 911 or uh, whether or not it was officer generated. We would have to go uh, into our system and really drill down into the data. Um, and quite honestly, there would probably be a lot of hand searching. Uh, and what I mean by hand searching is electronically going through each incident in order to do that. That is not easily captured data from our system. But is, is, it, is there a way to capture that in our system going forward or is that just not? I'm just that, kind of that's definitely something uh, along with some of the other data that uh, we're looking into as part of that. Uh, global approach to the Department of Transparency is uh, taking a look at what we do collect, what we could do better in collecting, and making sure that uh, we are getting as much data that is relevant as possible. One of the things that we could likely do is have a conversation with 911 to understand some of the calls dispatched to Missoula Police Department as a function of that larger number. Okay. Yeah, I think that would that would be interesting. And um, I appreciate um, some of the things that you've mentioned in this, Chief White, about the transparency, the kind of going along with that, the annual report that you were talking about releasing an annual report. Could you speak a little more to kind of what information would be released on that? I, I'm, I want to know a little more about that. So um, obviously our, our use of force statistics, um, and that would be um, everything from the, the number of incidents, the type of incidents, uh, the, the gender, the race of the involved party, all, all of that information uh, would be included uh, as part of that. 
use of force component of that. We'll also provide the public information uh, like I did today regarding the complaints and what's happened there. We will also talk about um, our enforcement activity. So a lot of those, a lot of those numbers that that you saw all up on there on the screen, being able to 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 highlight, um, you know, the the top responses from the police department. What what are we going to? What are we handling? Obviously, as um, as this develops and we mature it, uh, if there's additional material that we need to add. So, you know, for example, we're going to clearly talk about our CIT and our and our work with the uh, mobile crisis team and, you know, how how that interaction is going. So it's not going to be just facts and figures and numbers. It's going to be a narrative and a dialogue um, to promote discussion about what we're doing. So those, you know, how, how many officers we have, the, or how many vacancies we have, what we're doing in recruiting, what we're doing in community engagement, uh, talking about uh, the, the meetings that we're having and um, those types of things will all be um, items that would be included in that annual report. I don't want, I don't want to take over this. Could you do one, <laughs> we, one more, Amber? One more, okay, I, I'll try to. So one more question, I guess. So the Missoula Police Commission, um, could you speak to a little bit more to who's on that, how that works? So it is a three person commission. Uh, they are appointed by the mayor uh, and, and they have a term. And uh, I know when there's a vacancy, there is a global solicitation for applications. Uh, I'd have to let the mayor speak to um, the application process and, and, and how, what process he does to, to select them. But so that commission meets quarterly uh, and during that, that meeting, and it's, it's a public meeting. Uh, we had one just a few weeks ago and the agenda and um, was posted for a public meeting. Uh, so they are um, open to the public to, to attend. And at that meeting, we discuss um, what's going on globally within the police department. And, and, uh, and then we go into uh, that last quarter's complaints and, inquir and inquiries that we received from the public. And uh, all of that information is provided to those commissioners and they have read and reviewed the, the uh, complaint investigation package um, they will ask us questions if uh, they have follow-up questions and they discuss um, whether or not we've met their standards and uh, either approve it or uh, ask us to do more with it. One of the important things about that police commission process and, and about our complaint investigation process is we don't just look at the allegations that the complainant brings forward. So if there is something that the complainant hasn't brought forward as an allegation, but we have found through our investigation is a, a, a policy violation, for example, we still investigate that and hold the officer accountable uh, for that policy violation, even though it wasn't part of the initial complaint. And, and, and we have those discussions with the police commission. Yeah. Thank you. That's really helpful. I appreciate it. I'm sorry, Brian. Thanks for all the letting me ask. No, that's all right. Um, I had Gwen in the queue um, and then we'll get several more people. Great. Thank you. Um, I just want to take a minute, first of all, and acknowledge that there is a lot going on with the presentation today and you've conveyed a huge amount of information really clearly, which I appreciate. And Chief, you started a few months ago during the middle of a pandemic. So you're not only trying to communicate new philosophies, new ideas, um, the way forward to make it all a better police force, but also explaining the history of the last five, 10 years of the police force. Um, 
all in the midst of a social unrest um, dialogue that we're having in our community. So there's a lot going on here. I really appreciate how much you've been able to convey. Um, my specific question is regarding the rise in, rise in calls to the police the last couple of years because it was pretty static from like 2010 to 2017, around 40, 42,000 a year. And in the last couple of years, we've gone up to 60,000 plus calls per year, which is huge and really an underpinning to a lot of our police budget as we have uh, had our, our budget discussions for the last couple of years. And my, I attribute it to cuts in DPHHS causing more mental or social crisis intervention calls to the police. We've annexed a big chunk. Um, the city annexed more square miles, so that increased our service area. But do you have other thoughts on why, what is your read on why our service calls have gone up a lot? Because I think that's a really key thing to understand of what's going on in our community, if you have any insights on that. So uh, a lot of that disparity of numbers comes from how the numbers have been presented. So a lot of those numbers had excluded traffic stops or officer generated uh, information. So if you take our um, 61,000 number that I presented for overall, and we have roughly uh, 9,000 traffic stops. So it takes us down to about 52,000 um, so we can compare apples to apples here. So it, 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 is, it is a rise, right? If we go from 40,000 to 50,000, that's still a rise, but it, the, the rise isn't to that 60,000 number just so we're comparing apples to apples. And I think that you are correct in we have, uh, if you look at the numbers, um, in, in that presentation, you'll see, and if we could provide uh, some historical data on that, um, that behavioral uh, and mental health call component, you will see that there's been an increase of calls um, in, in that area. Um, we, get a, we, we also get a lot of calls uh, for traffic complaints and uh, people, you know, with traffic violations. Uh, that's 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 also an increase, and and you know we have expanded the if you look at the square miles that we're responsible for providing services to uh, due to annexations those have also increased. So um, if I'm recalling the slide correctly, uh, we've gone from about 29 uh, square miles to about to 34 uh, point something uh, square miles that we're required to provide services to, and all of that includes um, residences and, and population and housing and, and um, places for us to respond to. Thanks. Um, Mirta. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chief, for all the very useful information. Um, I appreciate it. Um, at the presentation you talked about key goals for FY21 and that included a police department strategy plan. Um, I'm curious to know if that plan will include ways to make um, our police force more diverse. Um, right now based on information that you gave me which I really appreciate, um, our police force is police force is 93% white, 2% black, 2% Asian, 2% Native American, 1% Hispanic, and out of all of that, 13% female. So I'm curious to know if you plan to address that through that strategic plan, and if so, how, um, just briefly if you can't right now, but I, I would like to know what steps the police department is taking in order to make the police force more diverse. Absolutely, that, that will be part of our ongoing uh, community trust piece uh, that is a, a portion of um, the, the idea and you know, concepts that we're working on through those strategic plan goals. And that does include uh, recruitment efforts. And we need to work with the, our target audience, 
um, and figure out what messaging um, and w that we need to use in order to uh, get people to apply to the department. Uh, people um, uh, of all diversities. Um, uh, unfortunately, in today's world, uh, with what's going on uh, nationally, um, uh, police departments, we're all struggling uh, in that recruitment effort to find uh, people that are uh, wanting to become police officers. So we need to, we, we need to develop that trust uh, within a lot of different communities uh, to, to show that this is uh, an honorable profession. It's a noble profession and it is a great way to serve the community you live in. And we would like you to be a part of that. So we will work with various groups to figure out how we message that and, and where we go. We can't do just the traditional job fairs anymore. Or there's there's got to be uh, there's got to be an online component. There's got to be a social media component. There's um, you know, and and particularly in today's world of uh, of uh, the pandemic, we can't have those in-person group things. We're, we're going to have to figure out a solution uh, as we move forward as to how, what that recruitment effort looks like. But it is definitely something that uh, we have been discussing and will continue discussing. Uh, Councilwoman Merrick. I have a number of questions, but I think I'm just going to put them in writing and I'm going to make a request, um, Mr. President, that we yield the balance of time to some public comment. And I would actually like to ask that we hear from some members of the public who have not been repeatedly commenting already, because I think there's a lot of voices out there that we haven't heard yet. Um, so I'm, I yield my time. Yeah, I'm going to take one more because there was one in the queue and then I'm going to go to public comment and I likewise am going to hold off on my questions for the same reason. So, Heidi. Um, I, I just have a question around the resident advisory council and what that uh, council looks like and um, I think that that warrants a longer answer. Um, so I am happy to take that answer in the future, but I would like uh, more detail on what the vision is there. We'll provide that to you. Thanks. I'm going to go to some folks uh, in the attendees. Um, Ms. Worrell, can you hear us OK? I can. You are, you are up. Thank you for your patience. Oh, no, thank you, guys. And um, thanks for taking our comments. <clears throat> so first of all, um, I, do, I do appreciate that, you know, this is a very complicated question and there's a lot of there's a lot of things that that need to be considered and i do understand that you know we do need a police force and we do need um they do need certain things however you know i know that a big concern is housing and um i just wanted to point out that in the budget here there is there's um only t only space here for one housing navigator um who can help up to 50 clients annually and there is certainly more than 50 people in this in the city of missoula that are going to need help with housing especially with the skyrocketing prices that we're seeing now um, and so i would hope that perhaps we would allocate some more funds to something like this and also to the crisis response team which i appreciate and i think is a good step in the right direction However, it is just a pilot program at this point and only 80 hours per week are being allocated to this and for only 10 months. And I, you know, I don't believe that it's been given enough money or enough time to actually prove its worth. And you know, if we want to try to reallocate funds from, from the police and potentially you know, take some of that burden off of them, which has been something that they've been concerned about, then we need to spend more time and more money on this <clears throat> crisis response team, I believe. So that was it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Worrell. Mm -hmm. um, Kenzie Cole, and I, I hope I'm not reversing the name. Uh, can you hear us? That's my name. Yep. Um, thank you for allowing me to comment. 
I'd like to first say that um, the reason that the diversity is a problem in the police force is not simply because of social media, but because of long systemic problems that have occurred in this police force, in police forces in general, and in Montana um, with bias and discrimination. I'd like to point out that while the police chief offers a lot of data, that data is inherently flawed because it's collected by the police department. I myself have asked to make police reports when I've seen bigoted and biased actions by the police and been uh, dismissed by police officers. I'd also like to point out that we still haven't seen an adequate response to the attack that happened on June 5th in which police followed the lead of militia and many people witnessed the police and militia had uh, intimate knowledge of each other in the sense of they knew each other's names, they were hugging and they were paying a lot of attention to one another. Uh, that still has not been addressed. Um, I'd like to know why these police who have undergone these implicit bias trainings are still following the lead of white militia members when they attack black people and uh, detaining a black person rather than the white folks who are there. Also, those charges are completely inadequate and police pushed the person who was attacked into not filing charges and told them that there would be no response um, if he did until there were two rallies. So the simple fact that we need rallies with hundreds of people in Missoula in order to see charges happen is also another problem with the police force that currently exists. And I do, I appreciate Chief White pointing out a really great answer to this problem, which is simply um, the budget, uh, if we need a, if we're going to get a better budget and a lower budget and help the police, we need to, you know, maybe have fewer police. Um, many of these statistics that he's reporting on come from the police themselves and were generated by the police. And I think if we did put our energy and time into um, not training that in uh, creating these trainings that have been shown across the country to not fix these issues and instead put our energy, money, and time into providing people who can actually help like uh, social service workers, people who do housing. And I think we would see a big improvement to the overall quality of this town. And I appreciate all you city council members for taking a critical view of this budget and the work that you're doing to see through the self-reporting happening here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cole. Mr. Thompson. Yep, can you hear me? Yes. All right, so um, uh, the, bears, uh, the, bears, the mayor's budget letter um, that, was, that, he, that he published uh, a week ago asserts that he views his work as incremental and that local government is about evolution and not revolution. And that assertion has been echoed in his uh, frankly defensive introduction during this presentation. Um, I know that he also said in that same letter that he is not tone deaf, but that's a pretty tone deaf reading of both his duties and of current events. Tens of millions of people across this country and the world are demanding a revolution in the way we approach public health and safety. We want to end systems that are rooted in violence and retribution and that perpetuate oppression and racism. This necessarily means separating calls for service for things like mental health or wellness checks or calls relating to homeless or unhoused people from the jurisdiction of the police to you know, other services like the, the mobile crisis response team. The police should just not be responding to the vast majority of non-criminal activity. We need to move away from this practice. Uh, the police budget has increased by about 78% since 2010 from about $10.7 million to a proposed $19 million for this year. Um, so I have to ask, has violent crime and property crime increased by 78% since 2010? Has the population increased by 78% since 2010? I'm pretty confident the answer to both questions is no. So why have we been increasing the police budget every year since at least 2010? And why does the police department take up more than 31% of the budget? Are we sure that, are, are we that unsafe here in Missoula? Um, you know, the, the PowerPoint presentation we all just saw seems to indicate that crime is, 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 you know, violent crime is down. So why do we keep allocating more funds to policing things? Um, I saw that there's a request for two new officers due to, um, due to increased challenges relating to our homeless and transient population in the, uh, that's from one of the um, 
budget uh, document on the preliminary budget site. Um, if we're creating a mobile crisis response team that is intended to, quote, reduce the need for law enforcement for these very challenges, then why are we hiring two new police officers at all? Why doesn't that money just go to the mobile crisis response team? And furthermore, why are we entertaining a budget request that is rooted in criminalizing and policing poverty and homelessness? Because that's frankly what this is. Why are we trying to force our police officers to handle and police non-criminal activity like not having a home or not having a house? Um, see the uh, public records that I have requested um, lack a lot of information regarding the content of trainings and the people responsible for conducting those trainings. Um, not all police training is of the same quality. So how do any of us know that taxpayer money isn't funding training that encourages racist or violent behavior? Uh, I mean, last week I, I was reading um, a news article that said Homeland Security was using training manuals that labeled protesters and journalists as adversaries. That's definitely not appropriate. Um, has anybody been performing any oversight over this? Has the city council or an independent department not affiliated with law enforcement been reviewing the training and holding anybody accountable? Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe on one of the training slides, it said that the Americans for Effective Law Enforcement, AELE, was um, providing uh, training certification. And I'm not sure, but I believe that is a conservative organization that was created in opposition to the ACLU and as a result of um, opposition to civil liberties victories in the Supreme Court. And I'm not sure if we really want our police receiving training from an organization that seeks to limit our civil liberties. Mr. Thompson, you're at about three and a half minutes. Can you? I'm going to keep going for a bit. Um, I only have a few more things. Will the proposed uh, Public Safety Advisory Committee members not have any connection with law enforcement, not be appointed by the mayor, and be significantly composed of Black, Indigenous, and other people of color? And will training programs have to go through them? That's something that um, concerns me, that it's just going to be appointed by the mayor and it's going to be friendly to the police. Um, during the presentation, there was a reference to at least one vehicle that was acquired through civil asset forfeiture. I'd like to know how and when that vehicle was acquired through civil asset forfeiture. Um, during my public record request through the city for all vehicles and items acquired by the Missoula Police Department through civil asset forfeiture since 2016, I was informed by the city attorney that there have been no Missoula City Police Department civil forfeitures for the years 2016 um, through 2020 inclusive. Uh, was, was that vehicle acquired before 2016 or am I being lied to by the city? Furthermore, is it really true that no vehicles or items were acquired by the Missoula Police Department since 2016? Or is the city lying to me in violation of state law? Um, okay, Mr. Thompson. And then lastly, lastly, how can you bring up the calls for service and the number of incidents in a presentation without providing a breakdown or percentage of those calls for service? Um, I quickly looked through the 60, 000, the, 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 the slide that had 60,191 calls for service in 2019. 27% uh, of those were for things like welfare checks, suspicious activity, disturbance, person to be removed, disorderly conduct, person needing assistance, camping in the city, trespassing, uh, suicidal person, found property, noise complaints, harassment, and incorrigible juvenile. Um, and for the 26% of those calls for service were for just extra patrols and traffic. You know, over half of these calls for service are things not related to violent crime. And um, the chief suggested that the calls for service haven't seriously increased over the past few years due to differences in reporting. So that seems to suggest that our, part, that our past usage of the police hasn't decreased crime and that further budget increases probably won't change that number. And I think that just lends further um, to the argument that we don't need to be providing as much as we do to the police. And I'm going to the next public person. Uh, I'm not sure the name, their initials are BCG. Hi, can you hear me? This is Brenna. Yep, Brenna, we can hear you. Great, uh, first of all, I wanna thank the uh, Chief Wife, Chief White for the detailed statistics provided. I personally really appreciate that tra uh, transparency. Um, however, unfortunately, I feel like we're losing the forest for the trees here. I think ultimately the situation at hand can be made a lot less complicated. Um, I wanted to address, first of all, that Im implicit bias training is not enough to deter, to, to, um, to deter cops from resorting to their very human survival instincts. We can't train officers to be superhuman. 
Implicit bias training can't shut off an officer's adrenaline and equipped with lethal force won't keep an officer from acting on implicit bias in the brief instant they have to choose whether or not to use lethal or less than lethal force to defend themselves. I also wanna bring everyone's attention to the fact that the vast majority of force used by police against civilians is used against people who are suffering from drug and or alcohol abuse. Police are currently being used as a resource for a city that is failing to provide its citizens suffering from addiction and mental health issues with sufficient help. Instead, we wait until they reach their breaking point and provide them with the resource of armed law enforcement rather than preventative treatment and rehabilitation. Police are containing the sicknesses of our city, but do not and cannot, no matter how many resources and how much specialized training is provided. They're not primarily social workers. No amount of training will change that. Um, I also wanna to respond to the comment um, that the chief made in regards to the fact that police respond to a wide variety of calls that often put the lives of police officers in jeopardy. This appears to be a cause of harm that can easily be reduced by the changes Missoulians are currently requesting, which is precisely that the variety of these calls be narrowed down and diverted to professionals like social workers rather than police who are trained in social work as an afterthought. Responsibilities, for example, could be minimized to things like death investigations and active shooter scenarios, just as an example. In doing this, the res responsibilities and therefore the budget of the police, police can be reduced. Also, the mayor mentioned that budgets for social programs and police are not mutually exclusive. Unfortunately, they really are in the sense that every excess dollar provided to the police department is a dollar less that our city has to give to social pro programs that solve the problems pol uh, police deal with, but at their source rather than at their unfortunate conclusions. And the mayor mentioned, of course, too, that we can't change the system overnight to respond to people in crisis rather than police officers. But we delay that change dramatically when we deliberately and counterintuitively increase police funding to fill this role. I want to thank the chief, the mayor, and the council for hearing us today and for the work you do. Thanks so much. Thank you, Brenna. Um, I have Mr. Fesperman. Hope I pronounced that correctly. Hi. Yeah, you did. Thank you for letting me talk. Um, I There were a number of concerning things about the presentation, but I'll try to keep it as brief as I can. Um, I had uh, an experience this past week that kind of crystallized the need for changes in our budget. And someone was at my house, uh, basically a stranger, who was having a severe mental health episode. and we were trying to call a mental health hotline. We didn't know any of their friends or relatives to call. Um, they needed to be to go to the hospital or to have some serious help. And we were told that all we could do is call 911. And the police arrived and the police observed the situation and they were unable to do anything. And the, it, the question I have is really who, you know, this is a problem, we have no one to turn to in those types of situations. And we were talking about getting additional training for the police, but really, as the previous commenter said, police aren't gonna go get a master's in social work or a master's in counseling. We have people who are already trained to do those things. So why don't we just divert the funding to those people? We can't expect police to be social workers. Also, Chief White was talking about the professionalism and compassion of the police force. Just speaking from my personal experience, I've only ever found police to be either unhelpful, as they were this week, or escalating the situation, or being unnecessarily aggressive or violent, or being demeaning to people. And I have, I've seen this in Missoula when I've watched people being arrested on the street and being treated um, in ways that are unnecessarily aggressive and disrespectful. And I think at this point, we've been listening for years and years about um, the racism of policing and the violence of policing. And if we are denying that at this point, I think it's willfully ignorant. And I think our goal 
as city council members and community members needs to be to minimize the role of policing as much as possible, to divert as much money away from policing and into expanded social services, services and response teams. Um, and then just a final note um, about the whole budgeting process. I've had conversations this past week that were very helpful with um, Amber Cheryl and Jesse Ramos. And it sounds to me, I could be wrong since I don't know a ton about it, but it sounds to me like the whole budgeting process for Missoula is dependent on the timeline set by the state, by the Department of Revenue uh, crunching the numbers. And then we there's a deadline for when we have to have a budget approved for the city. So I'm wondering if this really limits the amount of time to discuss the budget and have public comment and have changes to it, how can we fix that issue? Um, thank you. Thank you. I have one more person in the queue. Um, Mr. Larson, uh, uh, you have a couple minutes. A couple minutes, why thank you city council and mayor. Um, I'd like to speak on this uh, on this subject and give a little background on uh, Chief White from the Missoulian article um, that was published uh, March 4, 2020. Um, the headline is new police chief prides himself as boots on the ground. Um, he's been involved in 35 shootings in 10 years. Uh, he's also a uh, he's also a lawyer. Um, and <clears throat> he's uh, I, I think that these are, are relevant because it shows his experience and I, I don't question his his qualifications and perspective whatsoever. He is also a former captain of the special re response team from the highway patrol, which is eff effectively the SWAT team for the California Highway Patrol. He's also an investigator, a uh, digital investigator or aided in digital investigations in California and Officer White or Chief White, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, this is just stuff I've, I've um, articles I've, I've skimmed through from the internet, news articles and whatnot. So I think that, uh, you know, his insight into the SWAT team and the, the forensic investigations is valid. Um, <clears throat> but also the, the SWAT team has been scrambled uh, since he took over, I believe in January or December of last year, uh, January this year. Uh, it's been scrambled three times, um, including the downtown, uh, the downtown uh, active shooter scenario and as far as I can tell, we don't really have any evidence of a, a shooting actually occurring. Um, and then also to Burlington Avenue on uh, April 24th of this year, I believe, where the Missoula Police Department um, responded to a neighbor dispute involving a 65 year old woman um, and her neighbor. And they stayed out there with the county attorney's office for eight hours until they decided it was better to just go home. Um, and I, I believe that the result of that, as far as I can tell from our media coverage of it, is that there was no evidence of a crime there. Um, <clears throat> so I think that we need to address from the, the higher levels down what's going on with uh, issuing SWAT team responses. Um, I've talked with Lori Clark, the administrative assistant at the Missoula Police Department. There's a lot of confusion about these line items on the new requests. Um, and a lot of that has to do with how they're formatted, I believe. Um, I believe you should have the motorcycle and the, the transport listed separately. Um, we still haven't heard a year make and model of this truck or um, special teams transport. Um, we already have an ambulance that the SWAT team currently uses as their special teams transport. And as far as Lori Clark has told me, it is still functioning. Um, so <clears throat> I, I question why we need that, that specific line item. And I question what the cost will be for the specific line item of the, the uh, special teams mobile transport. Um, another Mr. thing I've addressed- You're over three minutes and- we're... That's all right, that's all right. We, we, don't, we don't have to stop. It's five minutes normally in person. I just, no, I'll, I'll wrap it up quickly though. It's not, you've got about 15 seconds. Wow. Okay, um, thanks. After waiting two and a half hours, they're gonna limit my, my commentary again. Um, I followed the rules and now I'm not, not allowed to continue commenting just as everyone else was. You extended the time for other people. Why aren't you extending it to me? 
I have extended it on each one of your public comments. Please continue. Okay. The, the second item I, I, I want to address is the consumption and use of 223 rounds and service weapon rounds by our Missoula Police Department. Um, it's written into the 2020 to 2023 uh, collective uh, bargaining agreement between the city and the police officers that they provide 100 rounds per month per officer for uh, the use of bona fide training and target practice. Um, it also says they may, um, the, the, the office may um, account for these bullets being actually used so that it doesn't allow for officers to be accumulating extra bullets. Um, as far as I've talked to uh, the assistant chief today, um, they are neither willing uh, nor uh, interpreting that agreement as, as though uh, they, they need to uh, account for all these bullets. So essentially we're just giving our police officers 100 bullets every month, whether they use them or not. And, they could be selling them on the open market. I'm not saying they are, but uh, you know, I, I think that it's an interesting thing. Um, and so I think we need to implement amongst many other pro, uh, changes to the Missoula Police Department um, that, that program, which allows us to cut costs on these AR rounds, which are uh, in a national shortage right now, they're more expensive than they've ever been and to my knowledge. Um, and then also implement a, uh, the Citizens Advisory Committee and a way for us, the public, to review the body camera, camera footage that occurs um, unedited and, and to uh, assume malnificence if the officers decide um, to not turn on these body <laughs> cameras or dash cameras. We know very well through the Sheriff's Department the highway patrol, the Missoula police department, how often these things malfunction, quote unquote, during opportune times for the police and during uh, debatably inopportune times for the public. Um, these are, these are all very big concerns. Well, mine. That's now five minutes in addition to our exchange. So I'm gonna, it's the end of your public comment period. Thanks. Thanks everybody for staying late. I appreciate it. That was everybody in the queue. Um, and thanks to some council members uh, for uh, deferring on your questions. So we should get, could get to public comment. I encourage you to uh, follow up with the chief and the administration. I have some questions along the same lines. Um, and uh, thank you chief and mayor for the presentation. Um, any final comments from anyone else? So, Mr. Chairman, uh, Chief White actually had a closer here. <laughs> I was not aware of that. He is welcome to do it. I will certainly stay. Thank you. Thank you. Just a brief moment. Uh, you know, when I was researching uh, Missoula and the Missoula Police Department uh, in preparation for this, for this position, I found that there's an overwhelming support for the police department, both from the council and from the community at large. And I, I can tell you that in, in the last several weeks to months, the overwhelming support that we have received from the public, either dropping off uh, goodies, treats for us, um, personally extending their thanks to us, the emails, the cards, the letters uh, that I receive every day from the community has been, has been extremely, overwhelming and very much appreciated uh, by the department. Uh, I also know that the city council has supported this police department in the past with providing resources when it's needed. And I respectfully ask that you continue to provide us with the resource we need to provide professional police services. Thank you, chief. I certainly did not mean to uh, forego your closing. I wasn't aware, so my apologies. No apology needed. All right. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, we will be adjourned. Thank you.